Thank you so much. We're just waiting for our members to join us. So give it a few minutes and we'll be getting things rolling. But thank you for hopping on early. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, I'm just uh, Jess and Jessica getting a message in my inbox from Stefan. He's not able to make it. He's got a bit of an emergency on the home front. Okay. Welcome. We've got more and more people joining us this morning. Good to see everybody. Ken, welcome. Ari, welcome. Donovan, welcome to your first meeting. Good morning. Thank you. And Courtney, good to see you. And Adam, welcome, Adam. And Jess, I will work in conjunction with you, if that's okay, to decide when we should go ahead and start. I don't think we have a quorum yet, so let's wait a little bit. Yep, let's both keep an eye on the participant list. Okay, I think we do have a quorum, but I'd feel better, uh, Jessica, if we could give it another minute, if that's okay with you. Yep. And welcome. Uh, Let's see, Bennett, Nicholas, Jeremy, Bennett, Bennett, can you hear me, Bennett? Yes, I can. I just had a grandbaby last week, my very first one, and her name is Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T-E, -E -E, Bennett. Congratulations. And she is, she is the most beautiful baby you've ever seen in your whole life. <laughs> and uh, when I learned the name, I knew it was a girl. I learned the name. I thought, I know another Bennett. So <laughs> well, I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. uh, congratulations to to you and your whole family <laughs> and to the new Bennett. Um, I'm yeah. actually named after uh, my grandma, Bennett, spelled the same way with an E at the end. Really? Yeah. Ah, excellent. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, right. And Guthrie, what do you think, Jessica? Should we get this, this show a rolling? Yes, that sounds good. All right, let's do that. Welcome, everyone. Yes, welcome, welcome, everyone, Monday morning. And here we are. I'm going to do a couple quick standard updates for everybody uh, and then uh, turn it over. Well, Jessica and I are going to go back and forth a little bit on some of the front end things. And then we've got a lot of work to get through today. So message to our task force members when we're in conversation, really talking and dialoguing about things. If you are able, we'd appreciate you keeping your cameras on. It helps as we're working remotely to feel like we're part of a team. Uh, also, if you can use that raise hand feature when you want to participate, uh, Jessica and I will work together to queue people up and make sure that we can keep the conversation moving without having any um, verbal traffic jams. Uh, We've also disabled the chat feature uh, for reasons of public transparency, because you all know this is being streamed on Zoom, uh, not Zoom, wrong way, YouTube, uh, and the chat wouldn't show up. So don't use the chat feature, but we do have plenty of boxes in the mural uh, to um, allow you space to post your comments and things like that. Speaking of, if you haven't joined up on Mural yet, task force members, please go ahead and do that. You've got the password. Remember to join as a visitor, that there's no need to add your um, initials to your avatar, your little animal. Uh, and um, also a reminder, if you get lost, like where, oh, where are we? Hover over my photo in the bottom center of the screen the one with the little star on it, or the MN one right next to it, also with a little star on the screen or on, on it, and click follow whichever one, uh, and that will bring you right to where we are. So you don't get lost. And if all else fails, come on cam or come on your microphone and say, "I'm lost. Where are you?" And we'll help you. Um, to everybody else that might be observing this meeting, know that we are using a tool called Mural. It's kind of like um, a big whiteboard on steroids, uh, and it helps uh, log the group's work, uh, helps everybody be able to participate, even if we don't have time to hear everybody's actual voices. 
Uh, and uh, Jess, my colleague, will be sharing her screen so that you can see what the group is doing or talking about. And that's also where the brunt of the um, PowerPoint slides would be. All right, uh, with that, uh, there's more information on the screen right now about where the meeting minutes uh, or summary is posted uh, with uh, um, the actual um, website address there. Uh, so you've got that. And Jess, if I could get you to go to the next screen, I think that's where we've got the charge for the um, task force itself. Yeah, there we go. So we've got a couple slides here. Jess will go through them um, slowly back and forth as we need to, but just a reminder to all members and anybody observing that the legislative charge for this task force was to establish um, and advise the legislature on the legal, medical, and policy issues associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state of Minnesota. For purposes of this work, psychedelic medicine means MDMA, psilocybin, I'm gonna get that pronunciation, and LSD. Um, and next slide, please. This gets into the weeds a little bit more about scientific research. I'm not gonna read through all of this uh, for you right now, um, but know that there's some uh, specific duties for the task force and Jess, if you could go to the next slide too, that'd be great. I think there's one more slide yep, on duties. So the duty to provide a comprehensive plan, you can see what we are charged with uh, doing here uh, per um, direction from the legislature. Uh, and with that, then I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica, so she and I can start tag teaming on some of the basic things we need to get through first before we pick up our first big uh, agenda uh, item. So, Jessica. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, welcome members and welcome observers. We're going to take care of some logistical items and updates before beginning the work of this meeting. So the first order of business is doing a really quick quick roll call. So um, I'm gonna turn this back over to Stacey <laughs> so we can get a roll call going, um, and then we'll move on to additional uh, logistical items after that. So, Stacy, do you want to start the roll call? <laughs> I, I can do that. I can absolutely do that. And I'm going to go really fast because we have to do this twice, once to do the roll call, which is required, uh, and then we'll be doing it right, like practically right next, uh, right after that to approve the meeting summary from the last meeting. So hover your fingers right by your uh, volume button and let's get cracking here. Uh, Courtney Amundsen, are you here? Here. Very good. Helen Bassett. Here. Guthrie Capsella. Here. Senator Julie Coleman. Julia? who legislature is in session. Okay. Uh, Paula DeSanto. Here. Jeremy Drecker. I am here. I'm going to go off camera because it looks like I'm under interrogation. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Stefan Egan is not able to join us today. I knew that ahead of time. And Dr. Margaret Gavian. Here. Bennett Hertz. Hearts are here. here. Excellent. Sure are. <laughs> uh, David Hong. Here. Nick Leonards. Yes, I'm here. Ari McHenry. I'm here. Uh, Senator Kelly Morrison. Yeah, there's the legislature. Yep. Uh, Dr. Jessica Nielsen, our chair. Here. Kit O'Neill. Here. Jill Phillips. Jill, are you here? Okay. Ken Sass. Here. New member, Donovan. And Donovan, is it Sather or Sather? You and I have not formally met each other. Sather's fine. Sather. 
Welcome, welcome. And we'll hear more from uh, Donovan in just a little while. So hang tight. We want to formally welcome you. Uh, Representative Andy Smith. I am here. You are here. Yay. Thank you. We know this is a busy, busy, busy time of month for you or time of year. Uh, Michael Tabor. Good morning. I'm here. Adam Tomzik. Here. Uh, Dr. Ranji Verghese. Ranji, are you here? Okay. And oops, uh, Representative Nolan West. Present. Very good. Welcome, welcome. All right. We have most definitely quorum. We can proceed. Great. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you all the members for attending. And um, so next on the agenda is we need to approve our meeting minutes from the last meeting in February, February 5th. Um, so assuming you all received these materials a week ago and have been able to review the minutes. Um, and uh, Donovan, you're free to abstain from this since you weren't present at the last meeting. Um, so you're not expected to have been able to comment on those um, meeting minutes. Um, so we're going to open it up for discussion if um, anyone, any of the members have any changes that feel need to be made to the meeting minutes. So I just want to give an opportunity uh, for folks to make any comments or suggestions that might need um, updates or edits to the meeting minutes. Uh, so just kind of we'll let folks speak up if they have anything they want to add or change to the meeting minutes. Going once, going twice. All right, so hearing none, um, then the rules of order require, require us to do a roll call. So we need to do a roll call vote. Um, so do I have a motion by one of the members to approve the minutes? So moved. Uh, sorry, seconded. Uh, Helen, were you wanting to discuss or were you doing a motion? No, I was uh, making a motion. Okay, great. And then Bennett, you're a second? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. So um, now we'll move on to a vote by roll call to approve the minutes. So I'll turn that over to you, Stacey, to do the roll call by vote. All right. And I'm just using first names here so we can go even faster. So, Courtney. Yes, approve. Helen. Yes. Guthrie. Yes. Paula. Yes. Jeremy. Yes. Margaret. Yes. Bennett. Yes. David. Yes. Nick. Yes. Ari. Ari. Yes. Ari. Oh, there you go. There we go. I got it. Jessica. Yes. Kit? Yes. Ken? Yes. Michael? Yes. Adam? Yes. And Nolan? Abstain. Got it. Motion to approve the uh, meeting summary from the February 5th meeting has carried. Great. Thank you so much, Stacey, and thank you everyone for voting. Um, so next, we're going to move on to some member collected feedback. Um, so I'm going to first start off with this, but I encourage anyone else that might have been connecting with the various communities and departments that you represent for your seat. Um, if you have any updates that you want to share um, over the last month, I encourage you to do so. So I've been hosting uh, monthly public listening sessions, particularly for the psychedelic community, which, you know, is obviously a small our sample of, of the broader Minnesota community. So it would be great to hear from other sectors um, if those updates are available or to get members to think about really reaching out between meetings to your relevant communities to, to bring that feedback back to the task force so we really can make sure that everyone in, in Minnesota is represented in the recommendations that we're putting forth to the legislature. So from, from what I heard from the public, um, from the listening session I did the past month, um, there was questions around how the legitimacy of 
different um, healing centers or service centers with psychedelic medicines are going to be monitored and how that's going to be communicated to the public and interested clients. So things around advertising um, and ethics and things like that. Um, there's been a lot of questions, and this might be more of a question for the legislators, on why these three specific drugs were um, approved by the legislature. I know the original draft of the bill had more than just the three drugs of LSD, MDMA, and psilocybin. So that question consistently comes up of kind of what was the rationale for including those drugs, and is there an opportunity in the future to, to include other psychedelic medicines? Um, there's been discussion around how we could potentially incorporate psychedelic education programs into local universities and also how um, ethics are going to be implemented in, in terms of the regulations and policies around um, psychedelic medicines being administered to people, especially vulnerable populations. Um, and then there was some suggestions around really kind of getting ahead of, of educating the public, educating other legislat legislators, law enforcement, things like that. Um, writing to your editor, contacting your, your local politicians, um, and really trying to get a sense of um, the state of the research and the science and the national conversations around this. Um, so yeah, so those are just kind of my quick high level overviews from specifically the psychedelic community. So I'll sort of open it up uh, for any other members that might have updates specific to the communities and seat that you represent. Yeah, whose hand is up? Uh, it's me, Rep. Oh. Smith. Yeah. Um, I can just answer one particular question you asked there very clearly. So I was the one who who held the bill in, or uh, chief author of the bill in the Minnesota House. The decision to focus it down on those three particular psychedelic drugs was purely financial. The initial um, budget line item that we got with that bill was about one point one million dollars for the administrative costs and other things that go into making this kind of thing possible, staff time, et cetera. And uh, there just wasn't enough money for that to be possible to be included in the health bill. So uh, we're talking to the department, if we had specified these three particulars and focused more rather than all of them, um, that came down to a more manageable number and that's why that got included. Now that does not mean that any sort of bill or legislation that comes out of this has to be limited to those three, that purely means the work of the task force. So. That was the reason for that particular change. Great. Thanks for clarifying, Rep. Smith. Do any other members want to provide updates from your communities? Yeah, Guthrie. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, so I haven't done any community listening sessions, but um, Jessica and I, um, sat in on a meeting with the uh, BIAC executive director. I also had a, a meeting with um, the director of tribal state relations. Um, a couple of things came out about that. Obviously we have our Ojibwe seat filled today, which I'm uh, extremely grateful for. Um, you know, I, I looked and saw on, on last month's uh, meeting minutes that, you know, there was that uh, amendment to the charter. So that's, it's great that we see that in there. Um, but what we saw a couple of things that, that really came out about that is one, um, there's, you know, the, the time that it took to fill the seat, um, uh, Minnesota Indian Affairs Council uh, really feels that, that it was um, unnecessary to kind of drag this out in the way that it's been. Um, it's kind of created some bad blood or, or furthered if there was bad blood before between the governor's office and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Um, secondly, you know, we had some conversation about tribal consultation. Um, and, and uh, my act feels very strongly that tribal consultation doesn't happen after the fact and that we need to uh, reach out to them and, and meet with them before the law is uh, um, proposed next year. Um, and and sort of, uh, you know, lastly, I think it's it's really great that we have a, a member coming from Red Lake is that was, you know, who was, pro uh, that was the tribe that had, a, had uh, proposed for somebody to come uh, beforehand. Um, so it's not like one native is is uh, interchangeable with another native, but at least it's nice to see that we've got representation coming from the same nation uh, to be on this board uh, with us. Um, and, and lastly, one of the things that was sort of carried forward was the uh, opportunity for the state folks on the call to uh, participate in tribal state relations training. Um, it seems like uh, some of this was um, 
some of this came about because typically when there's uh, boards put forth and there's uh, representatives coming from tribes that that within the statutes that are written, um, it's expressly uh, written that MIAC would be appointing these members. And since it was just a suggestion, um, the governor's office took it in a way that that didn't go in the same way of the tribes. So uh, not from the community, but more so from tribal leadership. Um, appreciate my time. Thank you. Thank you, Guthrie. The Guthrie for sharing that update. All right, any other uh, member feedback before we move on? All right, so hearing none again, just want to reiterate that, you know, it would be really great if each of you could reach out um, as, as best as you can to kind of get that feedback either from the department you represent if you're state appointed or the community that you represent if you're publicly appointed um, to help us with our work and making sure all Minnesotans are represented here. Um, so next, uh, we're going to move on to um, uh, welcoming Donovan Sather. So um, we're going to go over to Mural. Um, so Donovan can kind of walk through um, and introduce himself. Um, so I think uh, Stacy or Jess, you're going to kind of moderate that and orient people over to that section on mural and let Donovan kind of introduce himself and and talk about his priorities with the Psychedelic Medicine Task Force. Happy to do that. Uh, again, welcome, Donovan. We're, we're really are happy that you're here. On the screen right now, you see... Um, uh, actually, Jess, if you can go all the way up to our first meeting where the members have their um, background boxes situated. Donovan has his own box all set up here. And in a moment, everyone, I'll turn off the cursors. Uh, you know how I do that so that we don't have so many cursors running around. So hang on, let me do that right now. There we go. But you can see my cursor moving right around Donovan's information. Right up here, Jess will get there in a second. And then Donovan would love to hear from you and share uh, whatever you'd like that you think that this group would like to hear uh, more about in terms of your background and your interest in this topic. Uh, anything else that you think would be uh, notable as we begin our work together, uh, inclusive of you. So Donovan, can you come on Mike and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Can you hear me fine? We can hear you just fine. Bonjour, Gakino. We are Donovan Indigenous Cause, making our coons in the go, Magizi Gai Maquan Dodem, Mesquag Miwi Zaga Gang in Dunjaba, Nimuandum Aeon Oman Nungum. So that's my traditional protocol Ojibwe introduction. I just said, hello, everybody. My name is Donovan. My Indian name is Little Snapping Turtle. I come from the Baron Eagle Clan, and I'm from Red Lake. I'm very happy to be here to speak with you today and work alongside one another. So what inspires me is to learn more about how this medicine can potentially be utilized to overcome addictions and mental health for many citizens of Minnesota. My perspective is grounded in culture bearer, Ojibwe language enthusiast, and I work directly for and directly connected to tribal communities. My interest is in researching alternative ways of healing through natural plant medicine. With that being said, and that's who I am, and that's what grounds me in why and how, I'm not sure how I got here, but I was selected and it's an honor to be able to be part of this panel, this task force, to be able to help with research and looking into the different ways of how these medicines could be utilized to really help our are people that are suffering from mental health or addictions. Um, so just over a year ago, I'll just go into a quick background of just over a year ago, Red Lake Nation created Joanneman Committee. And our Joanneman Committee was our love committee that looked into and how do we combat the fentanyl and opioid crisis that we're facing within our nation, within Red Lake. So we did a few summits with a lot of different partners from air, from regional area, the state, tribal community members, our programs, looking into what can we do to really dive in and help out with you know combating these issues, and thinking about the issues of addiction, mental health is one of the you know one of the more in depth factors 
in being able to help overcome addiction. In August of 2023, I went to a National Tribal Opioid Summit where there was over a thousand attendees from all over Indian country that talked about what was helping or what could help or how could we design something to really dive into you know this crisis we're facing and throughout time and more recently we've never been faced with so many more challenges with addiction with technologies advancements within the last 20 years with all of this societal impacts on us as a people that really has and the opr uh, the epidemic we just faced with COVID that really boosted and really contributed to some issues that we're facing in our nation. So what I can say is coming from that conference, I met a few people that were talking about spirit plant medicine and that uh, a national conference that was going to be held a couple months later. So I attended that event and going through those different sessions and listening to all the different ways of these natural plant medicines um, that our Indigenous people from around the world utilize to help healing, it really intrigued me with the psilocybin, the psychedelic effects of healing through, um, you know, mushrooms and ayahuasca and peyote and these different medicines that are available that are natural plants. So when we think about that being a natural plant, looking at it as uh, the point of how we as Indigenous people connect with land, air, water, fire, everything and all the elements in all-inclusive nature, this has really been one of those profound journeys of mine within the last several months in connecting with and meeting people that are highly knowledgeable in this area of psychedelics and how the medicine is a, a really able to help us reconnect spiritually and connect with us. Like there's no measurements, quantum measurements of like how these medicines will really, the three that we're looking at will really change the effects of, you know, the mental health capacity. But there is a lot of research out there um, there is some that will, you know, share and tell how stabilizing mental health can, you know, be a benefit factor. So all I can say is I'm very blessed and honored to be here today and to be able to help do the outreach in Ojibwe country and the other uh, Dakota tribes in the state and think about what does that mean for our voice to come forward when all of this policy, we're looking at change, what does it look like for us in Red Lake as we are diving into and we have a team of people that we're looking at this in more depth factors and what are we going to do and how can we change um, the ways of how we approach healing through for addiction and then the most, uh, you know, deeper sense of mental health. So what I can say is it's a pleasure and honor again. And that's who I am. And that's a little bit of my journey no means my uh, expert content on this uh, topic, but I am pretty good at connections, collaboration, communication. I work under the secretary's department within the tribe as a project manager, which I wear a number of different hats from uh, working on capital projects to helping with operations, uh, assessing programs and helping a little bit with some, uh, some nudging, I like to call it. And I'm a helper. So my Indian name is Little Snapping Turtle. And when I got that name, I was uh, told to be a helper in my life. And that's kind of what's guided my path along my life. So here I am in this arena to be able to help and to guide and to listen to our constituents and bring that voice forward. Miigwech. Hope I didn't take too Thank much, you. but I sure could go on story at Dylan. <laughs> It's, it's all good. And uh, I know that you had orientation to mural last week. Uh, I'm going to help the rest of the group uh, welcome you through a mural tool that we haven't used yet. So rest of the members, if you go down to the bottom center of your mural screen, 
right to the left of my photo, you see a little smiley face. If you hold, hover over that smiley face, you can uh, welcome uh, Donovan by clicking on any of those emojis down there and send up a little love to him, a little welcome greeting to him on, on the screen just like that. So go ahead and uh, welcome Donovan. Yeah, thank you so much, oh, right. Donovan. We're so happy to have you here and so happy to be fully seated now. Um, thanks to everyone that helped push that um, and make that possible. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over um, to Dana Farley, who's going to talk about a recent update on a uh, staff departure for the task force. So Dana, I'm going to turn it over to you if you want to uh, come on camera microphone and give us that update. Sure. Um, uh, Chrissy Deutsch, who has been the uh, uh, planner we hired, uh, we hired two staff to work, uh, MDH hired two staff to work with the task force. Uh, most of you know uh, Carolyn, who's our research scientist, but recently with MMB and, and the group and, and others in the task force. And she's uh, recently has um, uh, left uh, MDH in the process of, of leaving and so uh, will no longer be with us. Um, and uh, if you have any communications that was with her, her out of office message uh, will have, I think, uh, my name on there. So um just kind of updating you folks on that. And we're taking a look at what might be some options for uh, her, her work in that. So um, we'll miss her greatly. So, okay. Uh, again, so any emails that were going to her can be sent to me, uh, uh, the typical um, uh, state mailbox, uh, Dana.Farley at state. If anybody needs it, I think people can find me. So that's, that's it. And we'll continue. Thank you. Thank you, Dana, for that update. And I also just want to give a big thanks to Chrissy Doach for, for all the work that she did. She really was doing a lot behind the scenes to connect the efforts and really, really, really appreciative of, of everything that she had done. So thank you so much, Chrissy, if you're watching. Um, we'll miss you. All right. So now I'm going to do a brief high-level overview of um, today's desired meeting outcomes, just to remind uh, task force members of, of what we're uh, tasked to do. Um, and so Jess, if you wanna put up the slides that kind of walk through our timetable um, so folks can follow along with that. Um, so the first thing is to review our project tracking tool. So this is our timeline table. And so this slide reminds us of our overall work cadence. Um, I think there's the um, next slide, Jess. Yeah. Can you go back to the, the table? Yeah, that one. Okay, great. So, so the slides remind us of our overall work cadence so that we can complete our charge. Um, you'll note that we are now in the plan development and recommendations phase. The next four months will focus on building up our shared knowledge, breaking down the work into bite-sized pieces, and pulling together a variety of recommendation ideas before we begin to narrow and prioritize them starting in July. Um, next, if we could move on to the decision-making flow chart. Um, so I think this is on neural. I don't know if we have a slide for this. Um, it was really kind of a kind of decision flow chart that was put together by, by Nick. Yep, um, we do. And, yeah, so we let's do. And hold on just a second. Let me get everybody there. So there's two versions of this. This is the, I think, high level uh, or is this the simplified version? I think this is actually the simplified version. I know it might still <laughs> complicated. Um, so this is really trying to help us connect uh, kind of the different legal, regulatory, policy, scientific research um, avenues that we're aiming to explore and trying to figure out how all of the different things we're doing in the working groups can tie together to help us kind of move along this process to develop our research and recommendations that will go into the report for the legislature um, at the end of this year. Um, so hopefully we can dig into this a little bit more, but just want to give folks a sense of kind of where we're thinking and trying to really uh, organize our thought process and our decision making around all this, because it's a lot of work that we have to do and we don't have a whole lot of time to do it. So uh, we'll unpack this a little bit more, mostly in, in the working groups. Um, okay, so next up, we'll be talking about uh, the scientific literature review progress. 
Um, oh, Jessica, Jessica, can I interrupt for just a second? Because I, I missed something. I, I screwed up something. It'll only take a second. Uh, and that is um, Dana introduced himself earlier and, and mentioned uh, Caroline and Chrissy's departure. But I failed to say who I am and who's the team over at MAD, nor did I do a really good job of introducing you for anybody that's tuned in for the first time to this. So I just wanted to say my name is Stacy Shogren. I'm a senior consultant with MAD. I'm here to help facilitate these meetings and do some work behind the scenes. I work in it, uh, in um, collaboration with my teammates, Jessica Burke and Nick Core. Uh, you see Jessica's uh, the one that's navigating and moving the screens and managing all technology. Nick is on site uh, because we have to have a physical presence when we're doing these remote meetings, strangely, but true. Uh, so he's there with Paula, one of your members. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, and then also wanted to mention um, that, yes, this is being live streamed. Uh, we're, we are um, needing to do that for open meeting laws. Open meetings laws require the public to be able to attend the meetings, but don't require meetings to be recorded or preserved. Um, as with other task forces and advisory councils that are assisted by MAD and on the advice of MDH's legal counsel, there are no plans. Uh, there continue to be no plans for um, uh, changing that and doing recordings in the future. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I hit on those uh, couple pieces. And Ari, I see your hand up. So let's see what you have to say. And then Jessica, I'm done. I'll turn it back to you, our, our fearless leader. Go ahead, Ari. Thanks, Stacey. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a question that I've had about why we cannot like go above and beyond the floor of only publicly broadcasting and cannot um, record for posterity. So can you say a little bit more? Can somebody from MDH say more about what, what their legal reasoning is? Dana, as a member of uh, MDH, do you want to weigh in on that? I'm not sure if you were in a conjunction with Chrissy on the front lines of the conversation with their legal counsel. I, I would hesitate to uh, record or um, say what our um, uh, legal was saying without, but I can uh, put that as an update maybe for the the minutes or the summary there. So sorry, I wasn't prepared to um, answer that at today's meeting. Okay, well then I would just like to go on the record to say again that I, I think I do think it's disappointing. I think it's a mistake and I really wish these meetings were being uh, recorded for public accountability and transparency and also for learning purposes for others in other states. Thanks, Ari. Thank you. We will, yeah, we you, will do that notation. Yep. And now, Jessica, I've covered everything that I was supposed to. My apologies. Go ahead. I'll turn it back over to you for our first big agenda item. No worries. Um, and Ari, I just want to thank you again for bringing that up. I know I've also been, been pushing this issue. Um, and so I think we can we keep discussing it as we move forward and think about how this might impact uh, our report and what we could recommend for future uh, groups that spin out of this project uh, if this is not something that we can get achieved in the rest of our meetings for the task force moving forward. Uh, but thank you for consistently bringing it up because I know it's something the public consistently <laughs> brings up as well. Um, and so, so just to gonna give a high level overview, so the next three sections of the task force meeting today um, are gonna cover uh, scientific literature review, excuse me, <laughs> scientific literature review progress. Um, so kind of going over some of the data from the clinical trials that Caroline has been researching and maybe some of the limitations of what we can draw from and interpret from those, um, just given the nature of how clinical trials are designed and how the FDA works. Um, then we'll be moving and well, then we'll take a break um, and then we'll be moving Moving into um, a couple subject matter experts that we've invited to present to us today, the first being Ariel Clark, um, who's going to talk about some legal and regulatory realities regarding psychedelic medicine, specifically around business practices um, and how that's been implemented in other states and some of the kind of challenges and pitfalls of that kind of space um, that we can think about moving forward for our own regulations and policies around psychedelic medicines um, and supporting businesses. Um, and then next we'll hear from Christine Dindisi McCleave, um, who's going to talk about kind of psychedelic medicine um, um, 
um, perspectives within the indigenous contexts um, and how that's being impacted by different legislation, um, specifically her work that she's doing on a working group in Colorado around this topic, um, and really giving us an opportunity to engage with these subject matter experts um, through open discussion with them so that we can really um, get a better sense of how we can move our work forward, um, given those considerations. And then we'll take another break and then we'll come back and do um, some working group updates around the legal policy and regulatory working groups. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Caroline, Dr. Caroline Johnson, who's going to um, give us a presentation and discussion around the caveats and realities of existing clinical trials in the scientific literature. So Caroline, take it away. Thank you, Jessica. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, my internet has been a little patchy this morning. Um, so if I drop off unexpectedly, I apologize and I will be back. Um, but so getting into it, I have started the research on the efficacy of these drugs um, as therapeutic interventions in the health conditions that I presented last month. Um, but there are a few things to address, I think, before we really get into it. Um, first is actually really just kind of a side note. So there's a, there's a draft document containing a narrative um, around these conditions that will be going up in the Google Drive soon. Um, you know, I'm going to caution that this is, you know, this is a living document that will be added to kind of as we continue the research. Um, it's not even close to its final form. You know, right now it's just a document for the content to begin to take shape. Um, but when I get that up, please feel free to, you know, to take a look and ask questions if you have any. But as I'm doing the research and analysis, I'll be presenting um, the results as we go. But since it's ultimately up to the task force as a whole to make the informed recommendations, um, it's really important for everyone to be on the same page um, in terms of understanding the context around the clinical trials and how those results can be interpreted um, because they're not necessarily representative of real life treatment. And so understanding the context is especially important in light of all the media attention um, that psychedelics are getting. It's really tempting to consider these substances as you know, wonder drugs. And a lot of people are looking for relief from really trying conditions. Uh, you know, mental health conditions are tough. Either they're tough to experience and they're tough to treat. Um, and to make sure that we do our best by those experiencing these conditions, we need to make sure we're clear on you know, what is being said with the data. So with that being said, you know, I, I know we're all chomping at the bit to discuss results, but before I really get into it, we want to make sure everyone has a clear understanding of their context because you know before the task force can make recommendations based on scientific data it's important to know what the science is saying and what it's not saying um, so we can move on to the next slide great so we're going to um, be running this section a little differently today than the previous scientific updates um, because there's no working group dedicated to the literature review and we wanna make sure that there's a space for task force discussion around the topic. Uh, so these are some of the big points that I'll be covering and then I'll be handing it off to Jessica to cover them as well. So next slide. So, you know, kind of the first big point that we need to understand about these trials is who are these drugs being tested on? As it is now, um, the populations being studied are highly restricted. So first of all, you know, we're really only looking at the adult population. And then within that, you know, just about any co-occurring diagnosable condition not explicitly being studied is excluded, uh, with exceptions that we'll talk about as they arise. But overall, you know, this, this means excluding people with personality disorders or schizophrenia um, or any other major psychiatric condition. Uh, these studies also exclude individuals with physical disabilities, um, as well as individuals with heart disease or liver disease um, or other major diseases like that, again, with exceptions that we'll talk about. Um, and, you know, pregnant people are excluded as well. But, you know, even within those that are included in the trials, uh, typically people taking medication for the health conditions that's being studied, um, they're required to stop taking those meds. Um, at least during the drug treatment portion of the study. So an example of this is you know, if the trial is looking at how one of these drugs may treat depression, if that patient is taking an SSRI, they're required to taper off that medication uh, well before they receive the drug of interest. 
There's a few studies that allow participants to stay on their medication, um, but for the most part, the results we'll be seeing are from individuals with almost no other co-occurring conditions um, and not on any other medications that might treat that condition. Uh, finally, it's important to note that like many, many medical studies, uh, there's also typically a lack of demographic diversity. Um, next slide, please. So this circumscribed population has implications for the safety data that's being reported that we'll talk about. Um, you know, overall, these drugs appear to be, you know, largely safe to use in a clinical environment. I want, I want to point that out. Um, but we do need to remember that the safety data right now extends to the populations that are being studied. Um, you know, again, we don't have much information about drug interactions, either prescription or otherwise. Um, and we don't have a lot of information about how these drugs behave in individuals with uh, co-occurring health conditions, you know, and how they affect psychological, physical, <clears throat> or physiological safety um, in general or in the long term. Um, and, and part of that is because none of these drugs are FDA approved, you know, at this moment. So we don't have any large scale phase four trials that can give us that information yet. As a quick refresher, uh, phase four trials evaluate safety and effectiveness in the real world. So the patients are prescribed the drug and you know, followed as they actually live their lives. You know, apart from safety data that is reported in the clinical trials, uh, we can look at case studies for safety information, you know, like what kind of adverse effects we might expect that you know, aren't seen in clinical trials or examples of drug interactions or health conditions that might result in contraindications. Um, that is, you know, information about who we should not prescribe these drugs to in terms of safety. Um, but we'll need to remember to take case study data with a grain of salt as well. Um, next slide, please. So these, these two big points kind of culminate with how generalizable are the results that you'll hear from these trials? And the answer is that maybe these particular results aren't so generalizable to the wider public at this point, but they are at least specific to our study populations. Um, and you know, it's important to keep in mind that there's some variability in methods and measurement instruments within those primary studies as well, uh, because this is a re-emerging field of clinical study. Again, you know, it won't be until we really have large phase four trials that conclusions um, about the generalizability <clears throat> excuse me, of these results can be drawn um, and, and about the safety as well. But you know, because we are in this position that we're in a, as a task force right now, it's our responsibility then to use our best judgment about what conclusions we can draw from the data. Um, and, you know, finally, I think before we pause for a discussion about this, I think it's also important to note that, you know, because these substances aren't federally legal just yet, some of the funding for these trials comes from private companies that may stand to make money if this becomes legal. That does not, it does not invalidate the results of those trials, to make that clear. Uh, but, it's, you know, it's just something to be aware of when we evaluate the results. And so kind of all of this comes down to you know, when it's time to start making recommendations based on uh, the literature review, it's really Did we just lose Caroline? She said Caroline, she was are you there? Uh, yeah, I think we did. Jessica, should we field Ken's question while we're giving uh, Caroline a chance to get back on? Is that okay? Yeah, I think the next point after she finished up her thought was to move on to discussion. To discussion. That's yeah, yeah. Ken. So, Ken, do you go ahead, Ken. Um, just for context, for me, when medical marijuana was first introduced, were there stage four trials established for that? Yeah, that's a really good question. There hasn't really been like successful trials with uh, smoked cannabis um, for a variety of reasons. I think we do have FDA approved versions of like synthetic THC in the form of Marinol. 
um, and also um, cannabidiol or epidiol X, um, which is just sort of the CBD component. Uh, but the whole plant itself has not been able to successfully um, go through the clinical trial process, just given some limitations with trying to study a botanical product through the FDA's um, requirements. And also um, there's been kind of a research monopoly by the DEA on the actual supply of, of cannabis flower for research. That's not great um, and not really is not really up to the standards of kind of what the general population is using. There's a researcher in Oregon that actually sued the DEA because she was trying to do this um, study in veterans with PTSD for smoked cannabis and the outcomes were not good because the cannabis was not good. Um, so she sued the DEA to get her own lab set up so she could grow her own cannabis for, for research. Um, so I think the, the FDA's perspective on this, and I'll touch on this in a little bit, is that efficacy data, that real world phase four like data is really kind of like the epidemiological information that's just out in the public from everyone using cannabis for a very, very long time. Um, and so they also are kind of factoring that in, in terms of safety, um, in terms of its use in the real world, world settings, but its official kind of like process through clinical trials has not been terribly successful for a variety of reasons. And Jessica, I see Carolyn, Carolyn's back on the list of participants. Carolyn, are you able to uh, come on camera and microphone now, or are you still working on some tech issues? Yes, I am I am back. Can you hear me? Yeah, we sure can. Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, we just fielded one question. Actually, we, that's not right. <laughs> Jessica field one fielded a question from 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 Nick. So, or no, who? who Ken. Yeah, it's Ken. Yep. Uh, so back over to you, uh, Carolyn. Unless you were thinking it was time to go into discussion. No, that was that. It, it actually kind of dropped off at a good point, I assume, because we're going into a discussion now about these um, topics. So it, you know, questions, discussions, anything we have a handful of minutes to go over that. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Um, I do want to orient members to the mural. So each of these slides is on the mural. If you have any um, things that you want to put um, underneath around kind of factors that you're considering around, like as we go through this generalizability, um, we're next going to talk about um, considerations with the FDA that I briefly touched on to answer Ken's question, um, and then any other comments you have. So before I do some kind of more discussion around some specific examples, I think, um, present a little bit of an issue around safety um, with the clinical trial process and kind of what we can determine um, around who psychedelic medicines might be appropriate for. I do want to just open it up for discussions and questions um, from members based on what Caroline just presented um, to kind of open up discussions around um, safety and generalizability with the clinical trial data. Yeah, Guthrie? Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Caroline, for the uh, great presentation. Quick question. Um, any of the research that you came across um, happened in collaboration with tribes? No, I, I have not come across any that has been in collaboration with tribes, unfortunately. Okay, thanks. Donovan? Yes, uh, does the research look at community-based programs that can fit into Native American communities or from the Native American communities? Great question. Um, so far, what I've been looking at, no, unfortunately. These are very uh, sterile, kind of the, the Western medicine trials that you will see. They recruit and, I mean, for these, it is with a, usually with a therapeutic component, um, but it is not being studied right now at the community level. In, in terms of these, um, you know, phase two, three trials. You got three. All right. Uh, Caroline, uh, you said mostly therapeutic. Any related to spiritual or um, in more of a group setting rather than individual you've taken? Not in the clinical trials. So the clinical trials are very, uh, they're very sterile. I guess is kind of a way to say this. So right now, there there is research out there in group settings, um, but because the task force has voted to look at the randomized control trials, um, it's a very individualistic process at the level we're studying. 
Yeah, thanks, Caroline. I do just want to follow up that some of the trials actually as is, is one of the outcomes to measure quality we will use something that's called this mystical experiences questionnaire, which really tries to quantify uh, kind of the spiritual nature of the psychedelic experiences. And there are some trials. I know the um, the study at UC San Francisco that was looking at um, grief in uh, people that had survived the AIDS epidemic um, were not doing treatment in group, but they were doing the post um, therapy together as a group. Um, so that's kind of been more of how that's trying to be implemented. I know there are folks looking to um, get more group based sessions open just because it's going to be more economically feasible to do these in groups. Um, but I don't know that any of the clinical trials have been published um, with results on that yet. But I know that people are trying to get ahead and think of that. Um, so we might see that coming through the pipeline in the literature. Uh, Nicholas, your question? Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks, Carolyn. Uh, just really quick. Uh, I think you mentioned that you're going to put sort of a summary of this on Google Docs, um, but any sort of uh, sort of summary we have right now, uh, sort of putting the conditions that are being researched along with the efficacy data in these trials, are, are we going to have sort of like a summary of that sort of like what the what the results have shown? Yeah, yeah, we we will. I'm going to I'm going to be putting up everything, um, everything that I'm working on, the task force will have access to as I'm getting to it. Um, it's, it's a big task and it, it builds upon each, you know, each step builds upon the last. So as I get it, it will be up there. Okay. Yeah. I just, I didn't, I didn't want to rush. I, I thought that was going to happen, but I, I think that just from my own perspective, you know, it's, I, I think what, what the foundation of all of this is, is that are there individuals that are not being adequately treated and are, is there a, is there a component or, or a, a a psychedelic medicine that would then improve upon the current standard of care for these populations. And I think once we have that foundation, then everything else builds off of that. So, um, and of course, speaking as a clinician, that's, you know, obviously where my brain is at, but it's, it, that just would be incredibly helpful for me anyway. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Margaret. I think, thank you so much. This is really very helpful. One of the things that it just like the takeaway for me is that, the research is so very limited and us as a task force agreed to kind of really look at, I know the research is all good, right? There's a lot of good um, indicators, but we as a task force are relying heavily on some of the scientific studies to guide our, our recommendations when actually what the literature is saying is that the, it's so very limited in terms of the generalizability, right? So then we as a task force are kind of given the, charge of generalizing in a way because that's what we need to do right so i'm just struggling with that i don't have a question i'm just that those are my reactions it's it's really fascinating and really interesting because we all know in real world uh singular diagnoses if even we want to rely on that as our um, criteria of evaluating who gets these substances that's unrealistic right so um it's complicated it's more complicated than i think originally maybe we even imagined I, I think that's a wonderful point, and I'm really glad you brought that up. I think that's why we ha are having this discussion section today, so that everybody is kind of on board that there's limitations to what we know, um, and we we kind of have to balance balance all of this, right? We have to balance what we can definitively draw versus you know what we might just have to kind of go out on a limb for. But again, I think just knowing the actual state of the science right now is a good foundation for everyone to have to then to then discuss and make these judgments um, on what we think is best for us as a state. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. All right, Helen, want to ask your question? I do. Uh, and so if I understood you correctly, um, the, there are private companies who are actually conducting have conducted some of the clinical trials. Uh, because of the the fact that the substances are not legal at this time. So what I wonder is that are they subject then to the same constraints that have to do with an IRB, you know, all of the requirements, uh, you know, that that apply to research. So if you could just speak about that for a second. Yes, they they absolutely are. Um, they they're held to the same standards as as an academic literature and academic research study. Um, so, you know, you're getting the same IRB, you're getting the very stringent, um, you know, safety and reporting, you're getting, getting the same kind of level of research that you would out of an, you know, an academic institution. 
So, you know, the results are valid. I think it's just something to re just to remember to keep in mind some, not all of these trials um, are, are funded in that way. So it's, you know, it's just a little tidbit to keep in mind, but the, re you know, the results are good. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. And just to piggyback on that, I think a lot of the phase two trials that we're seeing are what we would call investigator initiated, where it's not the pharmaceutical company that's doing it. It's more like a physician or a researcher that's interested in a specific topic or mental health condition or otherwise. And they're trying to get more information on um, its, its um, efficacy in that context. But really, when something moves into phase three, which we're seeing right now, what, what we saw with MDMA, um, or, or psilocybin, those are really the pharmaceutical companies then that have to put in a lot of financial resources to do those phase three trials because they're very large and require a lot of money. And they also have to kind of compete against the, the pharmaceutical industry, which puts a lot of money into drug development. Um, but I don't think it, it diminishes the science. It's just something to keep in mind as we're kind of exploring conflicts of interest and things like that. Um, so I think that's kind of why Caroline brought that up. But thank you for the this question. And this is Stacy. I just want to remind all members too, if you don't feel like coming on your on and posing your question or your comment that way, you can go into the mural on the blue box under generalization or generalization, generalism. Boy, what a word that is. That word right there. There's a space for you to post a note. Just drag one of the yellow stickies up, write your comments, and you're good to go. I just want to make sure everybody knows that they all have a way to um, be heard. Thanks. So to, to kind of keep us on track, I want to discuss one more thing, um, and then we'll open it up to some more discussion. So kind of, kind of switching gears a little, although not much because we've had a question about it, um, I want to talk really briefly about how the FDA fits into all of this. Um, since the task force is considering the medical model, and then I will hand it over to Jessica to give specific updates from the FDA. So when a new drug is proposed to the FDA, um, the efficacy and the safety data gathered from the populations we talked about, um, as well as results from animal studies, toxicology studies, um, you know, a lot of other supplementary hard data um, are all submitted to the FDA via a new drug application. You know, it's a very specific process. I mean, and we're actually watching it happen in real time with MDMA, uh, which I'll get back to. But, you know, one thing to keep in mind with the FDA is that it regulates products and not practices. And it regulates products for very specific uses. Um, and this is important for us to know because um, the majority of these drugs are being clinically tested with a therapeutic component. And the FDA doesn't regulate therapy. Um, it also only regulates drugs for specific uses. Uh, so, for example, the FDA is evaluating MDMA in the therapeutic treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, PTSD, um, and nothing else at this point. And so this can be extrapolated to the other drugs we're looking at that if submissions occur, you know, they will likely be for a very circumscribed set of conditions, not necessarily all of the ones that we have identified. Um, so let me use MDMA as a quick example, you know, and we can draw parallels to the other drugs. The Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAP, um, submitted the new drug application for MDMA-assisted therapy uh, for PTSD. As kind of a side note, the wing involved in this is now called Lysotherapeutics, um, if, you, if you hear that. Um, so if that application is approved, um, any treatment using MDMA or MDMA-assisted therapy for anything other than PTSD um, would be considered off-label, which, you know, given the drugs we're looking at may or may not be federally legal. But, you know, again, we as a state can, within limits, propose things that we think are best for us. And so I kind of want to hit on that everything we're doing is a balance. Um, and when it comes time to make recommendations, you know, we need to think about, you know, what the science is saying, what it is not saying, and then how that interacts with what the FDA is saying, um, and also what we think is best. Um, so that was just kind of very quick, quick and dirty about the um, scientific aspect of the FDA. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jessica to provide some more in-depth updates on the FDA. Um, and then I think some, some discussion on the specifics of clinical trials as well. 
Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Um, I thought I saw Adam Tomzik's hand raised. Do you want to ask me a question? I, I'm going to wait. You might hit on it in okay. in this next segment. Okay. Um, so yeah, so just wanted to comment um, a couple things about the FDA um, and what they're kind of factoring in as accepted medical use, because in order for them to make a recommendation to the DEA to reschedule something off of Schedule 1, which uh, has not happened yet, I think once something's on Schedule 1, it typically has stayed on Schedule 1. The amount of evidence that's required to demonstrate safety and clear accepted medical use is an extremely high bar. Uh, that requires a lot of data and a lot of money and a lot of these clinical trials. Um, and so I'm I'm bringing this out in the context of, of cannabis because there was recently um, a recommendation by the Health and Human Services, you know, sort of the branch of the FDA that's in charge of reviewing um, uh, medical um, uses for different substances. And so I think the Biden administration tasked them with evaluating uh, cannabis to see um, if it should be rescheduled based on the kind of accepted medical uses, given that, as we kind of touched on earlier, there hasn't really been any successful clinical trials with um, whole cannabis plant. Um, so it just stays in schedule one. And <clears throat> but there are there are a lot of um, state medical programs that are using medical cannabis. Um, and there's also a lot of kind of adult regulated use cannabis. So we have this sort of like very long standing historical epidemiological information around the safety of cannabis in the general population. It kind of obviously depends on kind of what that's actually been used for and some populations might be more, more vulnerable, but I think the general information that's coming out from cannabis when compared to drugs and other schedules like heroin, other prescription drugs like um, anti-anxiety medications, and also comparing it to things that aren't scheduled, like alcohol and nicotine, they determine that not only is it fairly safe under the context of kind of how they would evaluate what drug, which drug should be in which um, DEA schedule, but that the demonstration of clear accepted medical use is demonstrated by states approving medical programs that are endorsed by the state medical programs. Um, and so to them, this was a big kind of decision-making shift on their part to not include or not just only make rescheduling definitions based on uh, whether something has passed through a successfully a phase three clinical trial, which is the standard for new drug development, and rather looking at kind of how it's used in the population historically for safety and all these different medical programs that are popping up as demonstration of accepted medical use. So they have submitted a recommendation to the DEA to put it on schedule three. It's unclear whether the DEA will follow suit with that because they ultimately have um, jurisdiction on what they will make their final decision on. And it's not clear whether they will accept this kind of new decision-making process. Um, so that being said, I was recently at a conference, it was a psychedelic conference where the FDA and the DEA was there presenting specifically on um, their decision-making around psychedelic medicines and new drug development. And the FDA was saying that because there is so much evidence historically, like we have 70 years of data with LSD and um, psilocybin, that to them, that indicates that there is a long history of use. We haven't seen a whole lot of like, adverse events in terms of like physiological health. Obviously people have what are called bad trips and that needs a little bit of extra psychological support, but the sort of historical information on that is that it's fairly safe in the general population or adults um, that doesn't necessarily require the same um, parameters for trying to push drugs through the FDA pipeline in terms of needing animal research data to demonstrate toxicity. Um, or abuse potential because there is just decades and decades of research research already of basically this phase four data that, that um, Caroline was alluding to. So I think it behooves us to really think about what we're doing as a state in terms of what types of regulations we're passing and things that we're accepting that really do kind of feed the national conversation around drug policy and the way that the government is thinking about these things moving forward. Um, I think the DEA stance, from my understanding, is they don't really want to comment on it. They're not really intervening or doing much about it because they do want to uh, support states' rights, um, with exceptions, obviously, as Mason Marks talked about last month around, you know, if you're being a, an outlier and trying to really integrate it too much in the medical system, like they're, 
like trying to provide prescriptions through a pharmacy when it's not FDA approved, then that starts to raise some red flags. So it's kind of unclear <laughs> where things are going, but there's kind of some interesting changes happening at the federal level in terms of what we're considering as accepted medical use and actual safety and risk profiles of these substances. So um, I'll leave it at that for now and we can open it up for questions. So I'll start with you, Adam, if you have your question. Yeah, thank you so much. This is a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Caroline, also. Um, I just had a question about MDMA, which it looks like it's on track to be approved this year, but it's a combination of specific products and practices that it's specific doses. Well, psychotherapy, a number of sessions, you need to have a trained therapist and then MDMA and then integration sessions. And then, so, um, I guess, is that kind of an exception to the FDA typically not regulating therapy is, uh, and is that thing that's going to be approved later this year by the FDA? Is that necessarily like the package of MDMA and therapy together? Could you speak to that at all? Am I on the right track? Caroline, do you have any thoughts on that? If you've dug into that? If, if you want to tackle that, go ahead. Um, I, I'll, I'll briefly say that the FDA has kind of said they don't regulate the process around the practice of medicine. Um, and so they can regulate the product, but they don't necessarily regulate how it's being used. And that's kind of going to fall on MAPS. Um, they're training the therapist to deal with that. So it will be kind of a package deal. Uh, but kind of the, the training of the therapeutic component is going to come from outside of the FDA. Yeah, and just to touch briefly on that, thank you, Caroline. Um, I think what I heard from the FDA is, you know, they're, this is the first time I think they've tried to approve a drug that has a therapy, like an adjunctive therapy component to it. It's unclear what that's going to look like in practice, um, but they kept reiterating that we regulate the product and it's a up to the states to determine how it's going to be delivered and implemented. Um, so individual states need to kind of develop their own practices around that. I think when it comes to using it, as, as Caroline was saying, is off-label, if you're not using it in the exact context that it was approved by the FDA, then it might not be covered by insurance. It could still be available to people, but it just might be more expensive for patients and providers. In terms of timeline, we're looking at August potentially for that approval? So that's when the FDA has said that they will provide a decision about FDA approval. It takes a while to actually ramp up and put it out into the marketplace. So we might not see it actually being available until 2025. It might take a while to get enough supply <laughs> synthesized um, and, and get the, the therapist trained because there's just not enough therapists that are trained in this type of modality yet. Are there the supply chain limitations for MDMA like there are for LSD, just not as many you know, manufacturers globally, or is it a different thing? That's a question I think we should bring back someone from MAPS to answer, because I know that they are going to have something around like data exclusivity. I don't know if that means that like generic versions can't be produced for about five years. I'm not quite sure what that means. So it'll be interesting to see how that comes together. I don't have a good answer for that. All right. Thank you and so much. Jessica? Jessica, it looks like Donovan and then Courtney have questions. Yep. Donovan, go ahead and ask your question. Hello, great information. Love the session. Um, are there going to be any studies included or allowed from Median Country or uh, native plant healing uh, methods with the plant medicine? Or is it just going to be uh, Western based? um that will be included in like the studies this goes back to a little bit earlier with caroline's discussion and then there's a part two how will the task force possibly uh maybe collect some of that information if possible so yeah that's a great question um i don't know caroline did you have a response to that um so it's, it's kind of the task force voted to use randomized control trials specifically in this portion. But, you know, I, I think that if we can gather data from indigenous voices, that's not excluded by any means. Um, and so we don't, you know, we don't have to make a decision based on just one aspect. Um, 
So, you know, right now we're kind of at that rigid Western model, but it doesn't necessarily need to be the only thing that we think about in moving forward. Yeah, and, and just to piggyback on that, I think we started to realize as we were looking through the, the literature and the clinical trials with these three different psychedelics that in any of the indigenous research journals that we looked at, there wasn't any mention of these and it's not being done in that context. And so realizing that while one of our charges as a task force is to research the science and the medical applications that are happening through the clinical trial process, that's just one tiny piece of the way that people are engaging with psychedelic medicines and plant medicines. And so that's a kind of another aspect that we need to look at um, that I think we can include, but we're trying to figure out where does that information live? Have there been, you know, tribal nations that have done these studies themselves? Is that information accessible to the broader population that we can include in our task force? I think we're going to hear from Christine and DC McCleave later about like indigenous research practices and maybe how we can actually better incorporate this into our research and recommendations. I just wanted to add, um, our relatives on the north, there's a lot of good research going on in Canada with our indigenous population. So I just want to share that because that's kind of sitting through the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference uh, in November and hearing a lot of good things coming out from different studies and different trials and efforts and, you know, opening it up for, for that healing process. So thank you for your time and, and explanation. Uh, thank you for the great question. Yeah, Courtney. This is Stacy. Uh, if I could just interrupt for a, a moment. This is Stacy. Jeremy, I noticed that you came. You're on your iPhone and you're off um, mute. And I just wondered if you had a question. Sometimes it's hard to get your hand raised feature working on your phone. So if I could just check in with Jeremy, make sure all is well that way. No, that was user error. Oh, no worries. Just wanted to make sure. Thanks, Stacy. All right, Courtney, do you want to ask your question? It's actually really similar to Donovan. So thanks, Donovan. And um, I appreciate all the information, Caroline, and your point, Jessica, about the limited scope of the information we're being provided, right, that scientific data can give us. And um, so I also wonder about where's the space for, you know, what people might refer to as intuitive knowledge or you know, even narrative. You know, I think in the beginning we were talking about personal experiences being valuable um, as we consider recommendations. And so... I think that maybe there's a, I don't know if we need to create a space for that as well, where we can um, put some of that information. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think when we were talking about uh, the final report and how other reports have come together for the legislature, and there was one report that showed that was really effective at, at kind of changing the minds of the legislature, where it was a whole chapter in the report around personal narratives of how that specific topic impacted them. And I know there are tons and tons of anecdotes from the general population here around their their, their unique experiences and perspectives with psychedelic medicines in, in different contexts. So I think that could be a way to get at that, um, knowing that we're not really allowed to do formal research, new research to collect that information as a task force, but we might be able to kind of pull it in um, from our various communities that we represent. Caroline, did you have any follow up with that? No, I, I I think that was a great point that you made. I do want to be mindful of time. Is there more stuff we wanted to discuss? Because I know we're set for a break in about three minutes. Are there other questions? And we have one last slide to, to talk to go through here. Yeah, Donovan. Um, just it, it goes to earlier um, on like how to collect how collecting like comments or questions is there like a public uh area where they can submit questions to is it within it um i didn't realize or look look too depth into it but on like our the psychedelic task force website is there a way where we can submit comments and uh information to the task force as the population general population that's a great question. So there's a kind of general task force email um, that's listed on the task force website that is supposed to serve as that. And I think initially we got quite a lot of, of people both wanting to share their story and also just skills that they had that might want to help support the task force. And I've just been kind of collecting them uh, through these public listening sessions that I've been having. So, you know, we could collectively as task force members be doing more of that in our respective communities to bring that back in. Um, and I know we had specified in our 
much harder not to do new research and whether that actually falls under new research to collect that in a kind of formalized way um, is something we might be able to read visit if we start to feel like it's really a priority to gather that information to help inform our recommendations. Just a Thank suggestion. Thank you so much. Okay. And yeah, so on the on the website or on the um, screen, you can see here the link to the website and that fairly long email address, health.psychedelicmet. Sounds like, a, I don't know if that's a typo. It says health.psychedelicmemedicine at state.mn.us. Um, but there is a link on the website um, if you go there. Um, and then I guess I'll just, Caroline, do you want me to just touch upon those last points that's on that slide 19? Yeah, if you want to. I mean, I think in the, in the you know, keeping mindful of our time, these are things that we can also discuss as the research, you know, as we're actually presenting the actual data. So if we, if we want to make sure that we get to our break um, and to our speakers, it's, it's fine to do this next time. Yeah, I won't go into it too much, just as somebody that's been doing clinical trials with psychedelics and just knowing just how sterile it is, It is as Caroline has, has been discussing, that there are a lot of limitations and caveats in kind of what data is going into this and what interpretations that we can draw from that information, um, I think is something that we just need to keep in mind, touching you know, on each of these things, the functional unblinding where, you know, comparing it to an inactive control is really hard with psychedelics because it's such an intense drug that there isn't really a good control to blind yourself. Um, and then just expectations based on what's going on in the media that people are just convinced that this is a magic bullet cure for everything. And that makes it really challenging, you know, to navigate um, people running through clinical trials and, and, and validating outcomes. Um, and just there's some, a lot of unanswered questions around kind of the duration of these um, treatment effects um, because really people are just looking at their short-term effects and whether they help alleviate symptoms uh, more, more acutely, as we would call it. Um, so I guess we'll we'll close out um, for this portion of the task force meeting, and we'll take a ten-minute break, um, and then we'll come back at eleven a.m. to get started with our first um, subject matter expert for the day, Ariel Clark. Um, so, Stacy, did you have anything to add before we go on a break? I have nothing else to add. Just, oh, reminding folks that if they've got follow-up questions that it didn't, didn't get a chance to answer or ask, put them in those boxes that we had earlier. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Dana? I, I just say there was a typo in that uh, slide and we'll, we'll uh, post it after break or maybe during the break or sometime on, on that Very email good. address. Thank you. All right, see you after the break. One housekeeping thing, this isn't for the whole group. Um, I have to leave early today. Um, I have to leave at noon instead of 1230. I'm, I'm testifying um, at a legislative subcommittee meeting today. So just a heads up. Before we get started, just want to check in with Ariel Clark. Do you, are you present and are you able to yep. hear? Nope. Can, you, can you hear me or see me okay? Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks so much for coming. All right, we'll introduce you in about three minutes. Cool. All right, thanks. And we'll begin in one minute. If you can hear my voice, we'll begin in one minute. All right, this is Jessica. If everyone can hear my voice, we're going to get started. We can come back and get settled. So I'm really excited and honored to welcome um, our guest speaker uh, today, Ariel Clark. Ariel Clark is a partner at Clark Howell, Howell LLP. She's an attorney and policy reformer. Since 2010, Ariel has provided business, corporate, and regulatory advice to business organizations, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and tribes regarding cannabis and other plant medicines and psychedelics. She's a partner with Clark Howell LLP a women steered and values-driven law firm, which she co-founded 10 years ago. She also co-founded the Psychedelic Bar Association, the Los Angeles Cannabis Task Force on Responsible Regulation, and the Los Angeles County Bar Association Cannabis Law Section. Ariel holds a Bachelor's of Arts from University of Michigan and a JD from Berkeley Law School. So I'll hand it over to Ariel and um, thank you again so much for agreeing to speak with us today. 
and take it away, Ariel. Thank you so much. Really, really good to be here. Um, I'm really grateful to have been asked to speak and it's just really nice to be with each of you members of this task force, really commend you on your work. Um, so this morning I'm gonna spend about five minutes giving a short overview of six really critical uh, regulatory, legal and business considerations and then I'll open it up to questions. Um, and I'm just gonna say a couple additional words about my relevant work history. Um, as Jessica mentioned, I've been practicing law for 17 years and for 14 of those, I've worked in business, corporate and regulatory law firms with expertise in cannabis and psychedelics. And over the years, I've worked with really literally hundreds of cannabis clients and a number of folks in psychedelics, helping them set up organizational structures, get licenses, comply with rules and generally helping them navigate complex and evolving legal and political complexities when substances that are illegal become legal. Um, and so also, as Jessica mentioned, I'm a founding board member of the Psychedelic Bar Association, which is a national association of lawyer and lawyers and psychedelics. Uh, I also am currently serving on um, the California Psychedelics Bill Working Group and over the years have significantly volunteered for a lot of nonprofit organizations and political organizations around cannabis and psychedelics. So basically I'm telling all of you this because I've really lived, lived and breathed these issues for a very long time. And so these six considerations that I'm offering this morning are really coming from a place of seeing, you know, what both what works and doesn't work, and we can get into the specifics later, and I'm happy to sort of speak with you about all of that, but these are, you know, these are informed by sort of a lot of the mistakes that I see unfortunately made over and over again. Um, so I just very strongly recommend that they be considered as top of mind as this task force considers various models and state recommendations. So I have a slide deck, which I like to have to assist. So um, if, if you could please, advance uh, the slide one more time. So these are, so I'm gonna talk about six key considerations. Um, the first is real affordability. This might seem obvious, but it's not actually. <laughs> um, we've seen it not work in other cases. So the state really needs to run the numbers on how much any psychedelics medicine or services will cost program participants in whatever program is designed. Again, it might seem obvious, but in Oregon, it seems that no one really actually ran the numbers because it costs about $2,000 to $3,500 for one psilocybin session. And it's obviously unconscionable that a law is passed today that makes some sort of healing modality legal that's only accessible to um, the most wealthy. And I'll also mention here that there's a critical need for culturally appropriate accessibility, which also means respecting those communities that are already engaged in culturally aligned practices with some of these substances. Um, next slide, please. The second thing to really center is real business viability. So here, same thing, the state really needs to make sure it really runs the number on what any regulated program it may implement will cost business owners and ensure that the taxes, licensing fees, and cost of complying with the rules don't people put out of business, pe put people out of business. I'll tell you from the front lines of cannabis law reform in California over many years, that California's regulated market is a total failure. And that's a very sad thing for me to say. At least it is for 99% of businesses. Uh, for the 1% of businesses for whom it's not a total, total failure, it's because they're venture-backed companies and you know, they're now poised to buy out all of the distressed cannabis assets in California for dirt, dirt cheap. And so what happened in California, the taxes, licensing fees and regulatory fees made it impossible for licensed businesses to complete with the illegal or unregulated market, which makes up 70 percent of the market in California. And I'll just also mention here that Oregon psilocybin program is experiencing similar types of challenges. So this is a really big, important thing to consider. Next slide, please. The third thing I strongly recommend is don't recommend a law that supports a race to the bottom. What do I mean by that? Okay, I'm gonna illustrate this by way of example. So I've ha I had several cannabis clients who at the outset of starting their, their businesses and at the beginning of sort of going through the regulatory process said, 
we only want to use compostable and recycled packaging for our products. We don't want to contribute to the five islands of trash that are in our truly sacred oceans. And unfortunately, <laughs> about a year in, because the cost of all of these regulations and taxes and all of that, these folks found they could not make this good choice because they were up against so many other, other costs. Um, and obviously within this is a recommendation, don't make laws or recommend laws that harm the natural world. Um, and that leads me to number four, if you could advance it to the next slide, which is encourage or at least consider ethical business models. So a lot of people who start a cannabis or psychedelics business or practice come from a good place. I've worked, as I said, with many of them. But unfortunately, really, truly, the current culture of doing business um, and honestly, the laws that create a lot of these economic opportunities are sort of steeped in um, certain value systems that are really wreaking havoc on our planet and the citizens in this country. Um, and so instead of that sort of current story that the role of business is to extract profits for shareholders only and at the expense of local communities um, and the land and water, consider requiring at more ethical business models like nonprofit organizations, public benefit organizations, or maybe stakeholder ownership models. Uh, in Colorado, the psychedelics bill there includes a metric for e an ESG metric for companies or license holders, which is, if you've not heard of it, that's the environmental sustainability and good governance metric for businesses. Next slide, please. The fifth consideration is real tribal consultation. So all agencies are required to develop and maintain ongoing consultation with tribal governments in Minnesota related to travel, tra to any matters that have any tribal implications. So any statewide initiative or decriminalization, legalization me measure certainly will have implications in tribal communities. So the state really needs to fully consult with tribes meaningfully and timely and consider tribal input in dis decision-making with the goal, goal of achieving mutually beneficial solutions. I'll say that in California, we failed in with regard to tribes and cannabis, and that meant trying to clean up a mistake after the laws, whoops, law was passed, which frankly still has not happened yet. Um, next slide, please. And this is the last strong recommendation, which is real public education. I, I really honestly cannot stress this one enough. <laughs> So we, we are kind of shifting, hopefully, from the, this old war on drug, drugs are bad rhetoric that really statistically does nothing to decrease use. So my strong recommendation is in passing any psychedelics legislation, be it decriminalization or regulated model, real public education is necessary, which actually statistically does result in risk reduction. Um, and ultimately, you know, well-informed consumers are a critical piece of the supply chain and will ultimately help businesses this, and the state and practitioners in Minnesota succeed in any program. So our, our bill in California, the new psychedelics bill, SB 1012, would create a fund for public education as well as education for first responders, which I'm quite happy about. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to close with this. This is a visual of psychedelics that are now illegal, becoming legal, and going through what I refer to as the twin engines of government and capital. And this is sort of like if we are, if we just sort of do things business as usual, and if we don't really commit to centering these and, and of course other considerations in a lawmaking process, we really will see the same harmful outcomes that we see in existing cannabis and psychedelics programs and more broadly in other industries in this country. So here, inaccessibility, the businesses fail, there's cultural harm, there's ecosystem harm, and there are industry abuses. Next slide, please. So I like to also try to give some sort of, you know, overall <laughs> overall proposed solution or a way to work with these things because this is, you know, this is hard work. Um, maybe consider recommending or adopting a values or ethics, ethical sort of tool framework, um, which can help. And I've, I've found this myself in different organizations and processes that I've been a, a part of that sort of helps counter the doing business as usual, policy as usual outcomes. And in order to really support outcomes that are 
really beneficial and really mutually beneficial for communities, businesses, individuals, and our planetary well-being, which is something that matters a lot these days and all days. So um, with that, um, I will just end with, I really, as I mentioned earlier, I fully understand this is no small undertaking, <laughs> um, but it's really the only, you know, it's it, we want a healthy path forward and in all of the ways. So I just, I, I start there as kind of overarching things to really think about and just want to really honor you all for all of the work that you're doing. Um, and with that, I will open it up to any questions. Thank you so much, Ariel. That was wonderful uh, primer of your kind of perspective and, and expertise in this space. Um, so I'd like to, you know, give task force members a kind of first dibs at asking questions. Um, also know that we, we do have some space on mural to kind of plug in uh, different things that you might want to talk about kind of centering around regulations and policies that were touched upon and kind of from your perspective in the community or the um, state seat that you represent, what kind of policies and regulations and business practices are you thinking of um, that are aligned with, with what Ariel um, talked about? So does anyone have any initial questions to get us started? Yeah, uh, Ari. Ari, go ahead. Thank you. Muted. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel, so much. I uh, love this presentation. Um, one question I have for you uh, is about equity programs for new businesses, for you know, for groups that have been most impacted by war on drugs. Um, have you seen successful programs, either cannabis or psychedelics, or that any lessons learned? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, we're all in an iterative process. We've never been in a moment where these substances where, you know, these substances have kind of gone through these process of becoming legal. So I think a lot of what we've learned is what doesn't really work. What doesn't work is if you put social equity kind of on the back burner. So the first thing I would recommend is definitely centering, thinking about what program that you wanna have at the outset with real stakeholder community input. Similarly, having support for those equity businesses and individuals that are that is already in place, set aside, however that might look. In LA, we had the LA County Bar Association. We had basically a, a pro bono section where a lot of the lawyers would volunteer to provide support for these services or low bono. There was money set aside for that. So just thinking creatively about how you can support equity businesses and having that those pieces set up before you sort of open the door to all of the licenses is really, really critical. And then kind of ongoing support of those businesses. There's a lot more I can say uh, on that, but I want to also respect that there are other, other hands. And, and so I'll just say this, if there are any follow-up truly ask me, I'm happy to take one-on-one -on -one phone calls or give whatever feedback, email feedback. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Adam and then Guthrie and then Donovan. Thank you so much, Ariel. My question is affordability. Like what, what are the top recommendations you would make to us as a task force to pass on to the legislature so that we aren't getting into a situation where this is only for people who have yeah. sufficient means? Yeah. So big things are being very thoughtful, you know, make sure the taxes aren't too high. The cost of complying with the regulations, that that's not too high. I mean, I saw clients of mine spend an inexorbitant amount of money on legal fees, accounting, other types of subject matter experts fees, just getting their businesses up and running. Now, cannabis is different in, in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, as I'm sure you've talked about a lot, you know, a, lo a lot of when it comes to psychedelics, a lot of the work is around providing the services themselves. So something that might be interesting to think about is, you know, I'll, I'll mention that in California SB 1012, what that will do is create a state certifying body for facilitators. So think about like, you know, you have a doctor or other type of board certification. This would create another certifying body. That's interesting because you have subject matter experts who are certifying the people who will sit and work with folks who are working with these particular medicines. And, you know, kind of one decision point we're at is where will that be allowed? And, you know, something that really increases the cost, like we see with Oregon psilocybin program is um, requiring that folks only work with these medicines within special facility service centers. 
why, 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 why require a special service center? Allowing it in other existing office buildings, really keeping that cost of overseeing what the office looks like very low. I, I mean, you're facilitating psilocybin sessions. It doesn't need to be so highly regulated. So it's really about I truly keeping the cost low, obviously passes on, you know, the 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 sort of cost savings to the individuals who want to participate in the pro programs. And I'll also mention allowing group sessions is one way that's kept costs down, which maybe you've heard about already. Yeah, thank you. Guthrie and then Donovan. I'm gonna punt it over to Donovan. His hand was up first. Go ahead, Donovan. Thanks, Guthrie. Thank you, Ariel, for the great presentation and the information shared. Um, how can a federal recognized tribe as a sovereign nation work within the medical framework? of tribal communities such as, you know, this, this area. Can you repeat that question one more time? How can a federalized, recognized tribe uh -huh. as a sovereign nation yeah. work within the medical framework of a tribal community? Is there any legalities or is there any discrepancies in like a sovereign nation? Um, so for example, as Red Lake, we're looking into alternative ways of healing through natural plant medicine which we would, we don't exactly know yet, but we're diving in and doing a lot of research here. So on a, from your special yeah. area. Yeah. Yeah, well, if I'm, if I'm kind of understanding the question correctly, um, you know, as a tribal nation, you have, you have the authority to pass a tribal law, a tribal ordinance that would allow you to create a framework to work with certain what really whatever substances that that you would so choose within within your exercise of sovereignty um so you know I, it would it, i think you would do it in the way that you would pass any particular tribal ordinance i don't know if there's a more nuanced question is it in relationship with the state that you're asking just standing alone just standing alone. And yeah. I guess uh, just to add on to that comment, mm -hmm. so public law 280 within, you know, the state of Minnesota, all tribes fall under, all other tribes except Red Lake fall under public law 280. So Red Lake stands alone without having to be under public law 280 because of our stature and our, our how we stand as a sovereign. So it is a little different than other tribes in Minnesota. So as we are looking, you know, towards the possibilities in the future, I just wanted to ask your, your stance on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, what, what I would say is this, you know, I, wor I work with a couple tribal clients right now who are not just involved in cannabis, but are also looking at other types of plant medicines. And, you know, there are a, a lot of layers of consideration as they, there are always, but within tribal communities, we have a tremendous need for different types of healing modalities. And so it's really just kind of considering the jurisdictional issues that I'm sure you're already aware of and, and you know, setting up a, a system that will serve the community and going through, you know, that similar to what I mentioned earlier, the state having a responsibility to tribes to, you know, go through a consultation process, just being smart about, you know, consulting with whichever whichever other governments you know you're in relationship with and have obligations to in in the process of standing up that type of a program and what's also quite interesting is that you know tribes historically have uh you know we have a deep history i'm odawa anishinaabe by the way just why i keep saying we um we have a history of of not just intertribal commerce but commerce that goes all the you know before contact that went all the way down, you know, there's there's um, copper from certain places in northern Michigan down in the Mayan temple. So we, you know, we have a, a long history of, of commerce, and it's interesting to think about medicines and substances and kind of, you know, that flow when we're looking at certain of these medicines from the global south and the global north. So I, I know that's a, maybe a little off topic, but something that's been kind of quite interesting to think about with some of my clients. So. Appreciate it, Ariel. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. All right, Guthrie and then Courtney. 
Try to be quick. Um, Ariel, thanks so much for the great presentation. A uh, quick question, when you were talking about tribal consultation and sort of the missteps that we've seen in California and other places, um, <clears throat> so, um, it's really great because we talked about this at the beginning. And so for our folks who are either coming from the state legislature or from one of the departments, uh, state departments here, what what were sort of the negative impacts there where they felt either within the policy that was created, um, within the community health impacts, uh, lack of access, or, or could you speak just a little bit more on the consultation piece, um, yeah. you know, kind of furthering with Donovan's thought there, right? Like when we're talking about tribal health, um, that's an interesting and unique landscape. Uh, and in, even within Red Lake with the public law, you know, 280, they're still under Indian Health Service, right? And so if this does go into a space of like a clinical, um, there's real impl uh, implications for, you know, three or four of our tribes here around the state. Um, but yeah, if you could just sort of talk about, you know, the missteps of, sure. of consultation and the, uh, the impact that you've seen sort of straight away. Yeah. Um, well, some of the missteps have been uh, state governments just fully ignoring that requirement <laughs> um, and passing laws through either a ballot initiative or through legislation um, and through the regulatory implementation process that really just ignored tribes like fully, which is, you know, and that's frankly, that's what happened in California. Um, and so then you go through a process of trying to clean it up through the rulemaking process, but then there's, because it wasn't in the original law, then there wasn't any, any ability to kind of follow along and clean up those missteps. So then we're trying to pass laws after the fact, I'll just say in the con, like in this sort of, you know, sort of what happened in California with regard to tribes and cannabis <clears throat> that occurred. And so we had very few bills that were being passed. So there was little room to kind of create these fixes. And at the end of the day, um, there isn't a cohesiveness within within tribal communities in California with regard to cannabis and the uh, and sort of the regulated market in California. What that has meant is that tribes can't sell into the regulated market and so in that context, it's really like a, a, a lost business opportunity when all of California was their land. So, you know, the irony is just profound. And, you know, 85% of California Indians live at or below the poverty line. Um, and so the opportunity for tribal governments for economic development was lost. Now, I'll tell you what has happened, though, is that tribes are you know, involved in interstate commerce of cannabis. And so they just basically said, well, you know, here we are, we're here, we, we tried to work with you and you weren't creating this fix. And so I guess we'll kind of go our, our, our own way in this respect. Um, you know, I, I, I think you mentioned some things that are really important, of course, and, and, and that's much more centered here. I mean, cannabis, of course, is, is a substance and is a plant that's, you know, has a lot of healing and, and wellness attributes but certainly with certain of these medicines that at least you know you all are talking about potentially decriminalizing or legalizing they have they are you know they can be tremendously beneficial for deeply um you know for for some of the deepest traumas really um and so that would be a huge 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 missed opportunity and i i guess i would say you know lastly um There are a lot of kind of complexities when it comes to public law 280 and tribes and 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 I'm sure, you know, specifically with Minnesota and I'm not licensed in, in Minnesota. So I'm sure a lot of the, you know, attorneys who have expertise there are really best to talk to about those, you know, kind of the devil is in the details. Um, but, you know, I'm I'm it sounds like you're thinking about these considerations now and that's really important. So I I'm 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 so happy to hear that. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions or if that answered the question, but that's what I'll offer. Uh, I appreciate your um, summary there. It just feels like uh, long story short, uh, puts the tribes, uh, puts California in an adversarial position towards the tribes and we don't want to, um, you know, duplicate the process here. So, uh, Chief McWitch. Thank you. Um, Courtney, you want to ask your question? Sure. So I'm curious about, you said that there was some positive, um, you know, maybe 
education that happened with like first responders. And I'm just wondering about, you know, if any of that was like funded by the, or recommended and if it went, if it extended at all, like I think about physicians and therapists and uh, law enforcement, family court, like, yeah, has that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, so this is in the new California psychedelics legislation that is still sort of in the legislative sausage making process. Um, but what it would do is it creates a public private fund for public education and for education for first responders, multi-responders. And it's really broad, you know, and we are thinking very broadly in this respect. Um, you know, being, it's, it's not just being educated as a consumer about what are these medicines, but also, you know, I, I'm not, I, and I'm sorry, I don't know if you've kind of talked about these different tools, but, you know, there's really good information out there about what to look for in a guide, what to look for when you are working with people kind of in a much deeper dive so that, you know, it's not just about the, the sort of consumption or relationship to the medicine, but also really locating agency within the folks who may be participating in these programs, which is really important. And then to think more broadly about how what what education will look like in schools and with young people and with adults. Because the thing is, this is, I mean, you know, people are getting information, but it's usually at this point still sort of war, old war on drugs information or, and I'll just say this, you know, or information that is sort of, it's really cool and there's an influencer and it's on social media and the packaging is really dope. You know what I'm saying? And from my perspective, one thing that I would really like to see is a lot of strict limits on marketing and advertising that are through that, let's try to sell a bunch of products, consumer packaged goods lens. What I would be interested in, and I've been called the fun police on this and several other accounts, but that's fine. Um, what, I'm, what I'd be interested in seeing is something, you know, in Canada, for example, when it comes to cannabis, there's there are requirements that the cannabis packaging it's just be, you know, there, there are restrictions on what it can look like and on advertising and marketing, but it's not just have a vacuum and then there's, you know, no information out there. Instead, why don't we really lean hard into actual real public education? Because people are going to make these choices. They already are. It's already happening. But the more we are educated on, sa on, on safety in all of these different respects, the better outcomes that we're going to see for people, for community, um, and really for, for all of these state programs. So that's my plug. That's my fun police plug. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. That was so informative. Um, is there any other, we've got about one minute left before we move on to our next speaker. Is there any other questions? Or Ariel, do you have any kind of closing thoughts or overarching recommendations for us as we move forward with our work? No, just thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you're doing. You know, maybe I'm sure you do already. I do every day that I do the work I do, which is remembering that, you know, this will, everything I do impacts people and communities and families and, you know, the planet. And um, we really need, you know, we need, we need a lot of healing, but we also need it to be done in a good way. So yeah, just thank you so much for your work. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. All right. Um, so with that, and 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 we'll see you off, Ariel. Thank you so much for attending and, and sharing. All right. So we'll turn it over to our next amazing subject matter expert, Christine Dindisi McCleave. Uh, so she's a consultant and doctoral student at the Center for Cross-Cultural Studies at the University of Alaska Fairbanks Indigenous Studies Program. Christine Dindisi is an enrolled citizen of the Turtle Mountain Ojibwe Nation is the past CEO of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, where she worked with the United States Department of the Interior to investigate Indian boarding schools. She is currently a doctoral student in Indigenous Studies at the University of Alaska Fairbanks Center for Cross-Cultural Studies with a concentration on Indigenous knowledge systems. Her research is focused on Indigenous use of entheogenic plant medicines for healing. With a Bachelor of Science in Communication Studies and a Master of Arts in Leadership, she conducted her master's thesis on Native American spirituality and Christianity and the spectrum of Native spiritual practices today, including peyote religion. 
As a nonprofit executive, she pioneered an unprecedented national research scope, spoke at the United Nations in New York and Geneva, raised over $13 million, and helped write a bill for a Truth and Healing Commission in the United States. As an independent consultant, she was part of the Truth and Reconciliation Work Group for the city of Minneapolis, has conducted primary source research for the Alaska Native Heritage Center and facilitated program development for the Association on American Indian Affairs. She has also worked at the grassroots community level for the exclusion of peyote and the decriminalization of entheogens in Minneapolis. And currently she is a facilitator with Project Mosaic for the federally recognized American tribes and indigenous community working group under Colorado's SB 23290 legislation. Overall, her work continues to concentrate on the intersection of cultural, political, and spiritual agency for the rights of indigenous peoples globally, and the healing of historical trauma as a generational survivor of genocidal U.S. Indian boarding schools. In 2023, she was listed as one of the 75 most influential, innovative, and disruptive women in psychedelics by Double Blind Magazine. She is currently uh, the vice president uh, for the Psychedelic Society of Minnesota, as well as the Minnesota Council of Churches. So I will turn it over to Christine Dendisi, take it away and teach us all you know. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, thanks, uh, I will try. I will really try, Jessica. Um, but I'm gonna be limited on time. Yep, we don't need the PowerPoint. Boju and Dinawe Magani Duke, Dindizi and Dijinakaz, Makinakwaju and Dunjiba, Mikizi and Dudame. My name is Christine Dindisi McCleave. Dindisi means blue jay. I'm Turtle Mountain Ojibwe and I'm Eagle Clan. Um, I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, grew up in Minneapolis most of my life, um, you know, moved there in the 80s, so now you know about how old I am. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have a lot to share with you. This has been um, really interesting hearing your discussion today. I've listened in on a few of your meetings, not all of them. Um, and, and there's just there's just a lot to cover. So um, you're going to drink from the fire hose, and I apologize in advance. Um, first, I'm going to talk about my experience as an Indigenous researcher in the psychedelic field, and there's a lot to that. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about my role with the Colorado uh, Tribal Working Group um, around their legislation. Um, so I believe Jessica shared the recent article that was published um, in the International Journal of Mental Health and Addiction titled Traditional and Indigenous Perspectives on Healing Trauma with Psychedelic Plant Medicines. My section of that article specifically was Indigenous Trauma and the Psychedelic Renaissance, an Opportunity for the Evolution of Humanity. And there's a lot in that title because um, I, I always start, even when I was at the Boarding School Healing Coalition, I always start these talks with historical context is everything. You cannot have these conversations without understanding the container. And the container here in the psychedelic renaissance is one of ongoing colonization. Okay, so there's the um, history of colonization of indigenous peoples in this country or on Turtle Island here in North America, where our lands and our resources have been colonized and taken and misappropriated. Um, but also recently our culture. And, and in, that, in that area, it gets even weirder because there were US policies to eradicate our culture. Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission called it cultural genocide. The United Nations says it's genocide. They took indigenous children and put them in boarding schools to take away their language, their culture, their way of living, their plant medicine knowledge, their spiritual ways and all of that, right? So now, uh, you know, in, in this century, we've got this psychedelic renaissance or some people are calling it a psychedelic boom, which implies that its growth is rapid and out of control. Okay, so the psychedelic boom now has this interest in, again, indigenous resources, but also indigenous culture, indigenous knowledge. So there's a lot a lot of harm going on. Um, the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund recently published a declaration on the ongoing harms that are being caused by the psychedelic renaissance, okay? So that's your container, that's your framework and your historical context here. It's really, really important. I get very passionate and um, you know expressive <laughs> when I'm talking about this because I personally 
been affected by this. And uh, I think there's a lot of other native people out there who would say the same. Um, this con this field, uh, you know, of um, the landscape of the psychedelic renaissance is also dealing with indigenous identity, right? So we've got um, federally recognized American tribes here in the United States. A lot, uh, the, the psychedelic boom is global, but a lot of it's happening here in the United States and being driven by organizations and groups um, and legislation happening here in the United States, okay? So the only people indigenous to the United States are those who are from the federally recognized tribes. Some are not federally recognized. We've got descendants, right? You get into indigenous identities. Some of us have been colonized, uh, you know, boarding school history in our family, et cetera, et cetera. But then you're talking about medicines that are coming from indigenous communities around the world. Um, ayahuasca comes from the Amazon in South America. Wow. Um, mushrooms originally are the medicine of the Mazatec in Mexico. Um, and now people are looking at Iboga for its healing properties. And that comes from Africa. Um, the people in the Amazon, the, the Mazatec and the Ibuiti in uh, Gabon, Africa are all saying that they are seeing the impacts on their medicines already. They are seeing uh, a decline in accessibility rises in prices, increase in cultural tourism, right? I'm just trying to give you guys a really high level view of, of the landscape again, right? Um, there's a lot, a lot of complexity here and a lot of serious issues when it comes to the rights of indigenous peoples. And I didn't submit you any slides, but I am gonna refer to some of my own slides here to read because I didn't have time to um, submit them for your process. But um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, Article 24 says, indigenous peoples have the right to their traditional medicines and to maintain their health practices, including the conservation of their vital medicinal plants, animals, and minerals. Indigenous individuals also have the right to access without any discrimination to all social and health services. Indigenous individuals have an equal right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard, standard of physical and mental health. Um, also, Article 31 says Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their cultural, cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions, as well as the manifestation of their sciences, technologies, and cultures, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, and to include cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. So the problem is that the ongoing colonization of indigenous people's um, resources and culture is, is happening through the psychedelic boom and that people, um, you know, people who are legislating or even um, trying to do decriminalization aren't taking these into consideration. So there's conservation issues at play. Um, as an indigenous person who has historical trauma, I entered into this field wanting to research for my own personal healing, as well as to help others. Well, the work that I was doing at the Boarding School Healing Coalition, um, you know, there's there's a lot of, and, and as, as the other members on the task force uh, have said, you know, there's a lot of issues within tribal communities around mental health and health in general and, um, you know, other inequities in, in other areas. So uh, what I found is that there's, there's a divide, which you all are already discussing. There's a divide between the scientific way, the Western uh, worldview and the scientific way, academic way of looking at research and looking at these medicines as, you know, through clinical studies versus indigenous people's way of knowing and interacting with these beings because they are not just medicine that is a word that has definitely been co-opted by the psychedelic renaissance uh, they learned from indigenous peoples to call them medicines because they are but what indigenous people know is that these are living entities with their own spirits and as um, I believe Dr. Nielsen has mentioned before that other indigenous people are starting to speak out and say, 
when you abuse the medicines and commodify them and start to use them for, you know, your own purposes, which is not healing in relationship, then they, they change. And we saw this with tobacco. We've seen it with opioids. Um, you know, that was poppy. That was a medicine. That was somebody's indigenous medicine. And um, we're starting to see it with cannabis as well. That plant is um, being, it's changed. It's definitely, um, being affected. And the people in uh, Mazatec people are saying mushrooms are starting to change too. So there's a lot to consider that, frankly, academic and government systems are not equipped to address because they're transactional and they don't take into account indigenous ways of thinking and indigenous ways of being. In other words, uh, indigenous ontologies, epistemologies, and cosmologies. I can talk to you a little bit about indigenous methodologies and methods of doing research, but I'm, you know, you can probably guess what I'm going to say. It's completely different than the norms in academia, the, the standards. In fact, uh, as an indigenous academic, it's you know uh, been an exercise in having a foot in two worlds. You know, there's it's a very um, converse way of thinking and being and doing things. So um, I know I'm a little bit all over the place, but you've you've heard from people about nation to nation consultation. Um, I will mention to you that tribes already have um, legal access to peyote that's already established under the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. So there is already a medicine that tribes some tribes have been using and all tribes have access to. They don't have to go through um, you know, any kind of new legislation. You know, Many generations of people fought over decades to establish this right. So they already have that, right? Um, but there's something to say about whether or not they should be coming to the table at, you know, late in the psychedelic renaissance and engaging with these medicines in a Western way, in a colonized way. That's all I'll say about that. Um, currently, there is nation to nation consultation going on with the US Patent Office on a patent application that was put in for mescaline. The Native American Church of North America has submitted comments and a statement um, declaring that they view peyote and mescaline to be the same. Now, this is important to you all because it's uh, it's the connection between the plant, the living plant medicines and the synthetics. And they're saying you can't separate them. It is the same. Okay. Now, all the synthetics that you guys are talking about and other people have, have all been derived from plant medicines, right? Um, and I haven't researched this, but so this is anecdotal, but I believe I heard MDMA is uh, derived from sassafras and LSD is derived from, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, ergot, ergo, right? So the even the synthetics come from plant medicines, right? So you, you can't just be like, oh, well, we'll just do something with synthetic. No, you're still affecting um, the, the actual living beings of those plant medicines and the indigenous peoples who have millennia long relationships with them, not to mention the ecosystems that they come from. Um, so I think, oh, I'll talk a little bit about the six R's. Oh, and as a researcher, I have hit a, a brick wall because uh, anthropologists have really done a number on native people. Um, anthropologists from academia have done great harm over the centuries. And even as a native person trying to do research in native communities around this, there is a lot of um, pushback. Uh, people, you know, native people don't like the term research. Why are you researching us? Why are you researching our sacred medicines? No, no, we don't want to. And so there is a cultural taboo against um, researching the actual ceremonial practices. We don't document ceremony in uh, research. And so um, there, those are just some issues you're gonna run into when you start to look for research with 
uh, tribal people or from an indigenous perspective. And I noticed um, that you guys do have the six R's in your little toolbox. And so I wanna talk about that a little bit more. Uh, those six R's of indigenous research are respect, relationship, relevance, reciprocity, responsibility, and representation. So respect is not just respect for indigenous peoples, respect for each other as human beings. When I greeted you today, I said, Buju and Dinawe Duke, greetings my relatives because although we're not maybe blood related, we are related as human beings and as living beings on this planet. We are related to everything around us, not just other humans. Uh, we're related to our the land, the air, the water. It's all related. What we do affects one another. And that's also what it means in the next R, relationship. So when you want to do research, with indigenous people or that affects indigenous people, you have to consider all of those relationships at play. It, it's complicated, I know. <laughs> um, relevance, right? What, and, and not just, um, you know, what, how is this relevant to us, the people wanting to do the research? How is this relevant to the indigenous communities that you're researching with? How is it relevant to them? That's the big question that usually that's that's really what flips academia, you know, on its head is they, they don't tend to think of research that way um, and reciprocity. What will this give back to those indigenous communities and, and the people of being affected by this research? It has to give back. There has to be something in it for them. Otherwise, why would they even bother to participate in your research? Um, a responsibility. The researchers have a responsibility to all of that, to, to the communities that they're researching with, to the ecosystem, to the resources, to, to all the relations, um, to be ethical and like above and beyond what academia requires through IRB process is ethical. The minute you say you're researching with indigenous peoples, it takes it up a notch, okay? Because it's technically like a vulnerable population. They've been subjected to colonization and, um, and unethical research practices um, and representation. There's um, a trend now for co-creation of knowledge rather than a researcher coming in, which is very paternalistic and you know colonial. We're gonna come in, we're gonna research, we're gonna tell you what the data and findings are, but rather to, do, to make sure that indigenous knowledge, worldview, perspectives, voices are really truly represented in the research, um, it should be a co-creation of knowledge and they should be acknowledged as such. Um, so yeah, so with, I only have a few more minutes. So I'll, with that, I'll segue to what happened in Colorado. Um, oh, I did have one note here under the um, six R's you know, all of that responsibility and respect and, and reciprocity and relationship. Um, I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse. <laughs> I'm really glad Donovan spoke, you know, about the Ojibwe seat being filled today, but I applied to be part of this task force. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, I could have been one of your task force members. Um, but, you know, and I did, I was proactive in reaching out to the Office of Boards and Commissions at the governor's office. I still never really got a final answer on why I wasn't selected. So there wasn't a lot of transparency in the process. They did talk to me, but I had to, I had to beat down their door. Um, I was, I was pretty persistent in um, reaching out. Um, so anyways, that's, that's enough about that. So, um, you know, great. Cause now I don't really have time. <laughs> I'm doing this thing in, in Colorado. I used to live there and um, I'm working with Project Mosaic, which is a, a native owned consulting firm. And uh, they were contracted with Colorado to, to do the tribal working group. Um, Colorado is looking at psilocybin, mescaline containing cacti, which means excluding peyote, which means San Pedro, which is also a, an indigenous medicine. Um, uh, and, and tied to indigenous communities that use that. And they are also seeing conservation issues, um, but they're looking at ayahuasca and iboga, right? So um, none of these medicines that they are looking at um, regulating are indigenous to the United States. None of those medicines, okay? Psilocybin can be grown anywhere, but that's 
not where it originally comes from. So um, the working group is looking at, uh, in the statute, there are four areas that we will be addressing. Um, I guess I will read them. I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna go over my 20 minutes. So I still have some time for your Q and A, but I'm gonna read them even though they're very, you know, legalese. Um, but it's essentially, we're gonna be addressing misappropriation, commercialization, conservation, and best practices. But it reads, uh, avoiding the misappropriation and exploitation of the federally recognized tribes and indigenous peoples, communities, cultures, and religions. Avoiding the excessive commercialization of natural medicine, natural medicine product, and natural medicine services. Any conservation issues associated with the legalization and regulation of natural medicine or natural medicine products, including the potential for further depletion of peyote due to peyote being a source of mescaline. And best practices and open communication to build trust and understanding between the federally recognized tribes and indigenous peoples and communities, the board, the division, the state licensing authority and the law enforcement agencies for the purpose of avoiding unnecessary burdens and criminalization of traditional tribal and indigenous uses of natural medicine. Yeah, that reminds me, I forgot to talk about my master's thesis a little bit too, and um, the results of that study around Christianity and native spirituality and a little bit of history of the Native American church, a little bit of history of the Native American church and, and peyote. And um, when I earlier, when I said tribes already have this federally, you know, um, recognized access to, to use peyote, there is an issue with the Native American church because the Native American church started to incorporate Christianity into its practices. So even, even this, um, you know, uh, religious freedom and indigenous right has been tainted by colonization. And for that reason, some um, tribal people, individuals, tribal citizens, and even tribal nations don't really want to interact with the Native American church. That is to say that not all peyote um, religion or peyote ceremonies or peyote meetings um, use Christian Christianity. So um, just, just wanted to throw that out there too. Uh, so when you get into, when you talk about religious use, it gets really complicated in that area too, whether you're talking about in religious use for non-Indigenous peoples or religious use for Indigenous peoples. Um, but the little bit of history about what happened in Colorado is, yes, it was a ballot initiative, Prop 122 passed, and then um, there was a advisory board, the Natural Medicine um, Advisory Board was established. There were a couple indigenous people appointed and then they had this indigenous subcommittee. However, um, no one on the advisory board or in the indigenous subcommittee was a tribal citizen. And so um, the native community in Colorado started to speak out and say, we're not being represented, um, you know, kind of, you know, the issues that you've already been talking about today. Um, and that Ariel Clark made a really good point to, you know, to, to highlight. So um, the legislature actually passed um, a separate act, and that's where we got SB 23290 to rewrite Prop 122 and include this tribal working group that that is going to um, take place. Meetings haven't started. We haven't assembled the working group as of yet. We're currently still taking applications. Um, that work will happen, you know, throughout this year, and we'll be writing a report and making recommendations to um, DORA, you know, the Department of Regulatory Agencies in Colorado. Um, so I know I threw a lot at you and I was a bit all over the place, but I had a lot to say. <laughs> so now I'll open it to Q&A. Thank you so much, Christine. Didn't you see that was amazing? A lot of information. <laughs> From the fire hose, as you put it. Uh, so I do want to open it up uh, for for questions um, from from the task force members. Yep, Donovan. Thank you for that big drink. I really appreciate it. Um, great information, historical knowledge, all of that greatness. Um, so I just want to share a couple words uh, because I'm a Ojibwe language enthusiast and the emphasis particle breakdowns of these words and how does it mean and just a little example of like what Christine shared. So as we think about the word debwe, debwe in rough English terms or definition is truth, but it breaks down even further and it talks about that interconnectedness. 
De, the first part of that word, refers to ote, our heart. The bue refers to that vibration it gives. So when we're in tune, we can feel that truth. We could feel that sense of ah, uh, someone's just shooting the, the breeze or someone's just BSing me. So with that one word, that historical knowledge and that itemized uh, way of breaking it down, thinking about how that all that interconnectedness uh, really works and entails within our language, all comes back to that natural plant medicine. So here's another one I really love is uh, Nibba. Nibba is sleep, rough English terms. But Ni refers to this physical being. Ba refers to that energy and that traveling light. So when we're sleeping, our, our physical bodies need sleep, but our spirits don't need the rest. And our spirits will travel ahead. They'll, they can visit the past. They can be, visit people that have passed on. They can meet people that we haven't met yet in those deja vu moments. So I'm just sharing this little bit of history and language because this is the beauty of who we are as Anishinaabe. And each Indigenous population, no matter who it is, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, um, Nooksack, any, any languages that are out there, Indigenous populations have their own definitions of how they break down and how that heart sense feeling is with the words and everything's interconnected. So I just wanted to add that on. I guess there is one question I have for Christine is how would you recommend the task force maybe reaching out and doing some of that? How would you suggest like going to a community and, and maybe and doing some of that research, the methodologies that you spoke of? I know I'll be on my journey and I've already been uh, for a couple months now since thinking about this and the circles I walk in we have from spiritual to religious to just our community and talking to other people that I know in leadership positions. But what would like what would you share and recommend? Because I'd really love to hear. Miigwech. Oh, miigwech, chi miigwech, Donovan. Um, that was beautiful because it, while you were talking, I I remembered um, and I remembered it this morning, but it, it came to mind again. I I had a dream about my grandfather last night. He was with me in my dream, um, and that's a really special thing because he's um, why I do a lot of this work. He went to um, Indian boarding school, and um, yeah, so that was amazing that you brought that up um, because. I, I forgot a couple of things and I will answer your question. I forgot to talk about the rights of nature that's really prevalent in, in this conversation. Um, and really quickly, I'll say that um, Ecuador and Bolivia have uh, rights of nature clauses in their constitutions. Um, Ho-Chunk Nation, um, Ponca uh, nations also have um, rights of nature. And um, let's see. There, there's another tribe. I want to say White Earth did something too. Anyways, there's there's other examples of um, indigenous peoples around the world acknowledging the rights of nature. And and um, at this point in human history on this planet, it's that's that needs we need more of that. Okay, so um, I forgot to mention that. I just wanted to add it. I honestly. Your question, Donovan, is really big, and I think of it in two parts. You know, what can this task force do, but also like um, outside this task force, what should be done? And I think um, that research with well, conversations in general across the country with people who are legislating or decriminalizing natural medicines or synthetics for that matter, psychedelics, entheogens, whatever you want to call them. Um, <clears throat> probably won't get very far trying to do tribal consultation. <laughs> Sorry. That is the, you know, the, the de way. <laughs> that's the, that's the truth. Um, because tribal leaders, tribal governments are dealing with a lot of issues on, on their own, not only running tiny nations, but, you know, addressing, um, the historical trauma and, and the inequities and, and other issues that they have. And, um, in, in their communities, in their populations. So my findings have been, um, because I do this work kind of nationally, basically is that a lot of tribes here in the United States aren't, aren't 
ready for the conversation, aren't having the conversation, and particularly won't engage when you say psychedelics, because those are drugs and the rhetoric of the Nixon era is still with us and they just say no, right? Um, and, and like I said, not all tribes are peyote tribes. Um, and so when it comes to, to research, it's a uh, complicated landscape. There is a researcher, uh, a Diné researcher, Marlena Robbins out of Berkeley, who's doing some, um, she's currently has a survey open right now around um, psilocybin with urban native populations in the Northwest and Southwest. So that'll be some interesting indigenous research to keep an eye on. Um, that's, you know, it's currently collecting data right now, so we, we won't have results for a while, but, um, you know, my own dissertation that I, I plan to do this, this summer, I, I was hoping to do it with a, a tribe, but like I said, that that's not possible. They're not, they're not there yet. And that's why, you know, earlier I said, I, it breaks my heart to see tribes coming to the table, um, you know, late, like in, in the conversation. And, and that's because, the conversation is um, very focused on the clinical model and um, talking about these medicines from a colonization standpoint, right? And capitalist and commodification standpoint. If you switch the way you talk about it and you talk about medicines and ceremonies and the land and the water and our connection to these things, then, then the conversation is is different. So I think that's that's where the indigenous research is is going to happen, um, because conservation is uh, is an issue and traditional ecological knowledge. We, you know, we after cultural genocide, it's it's amazing we have any traditional ecological knowledge left. Right, that that knowledge had to survive genocide. It had to go underground. It had to be passed down from generation to generation in secret. So um, these things are very sacred and very protected. And um, any research that's happening um, really needs to take all that into consideration. Thank you. I do wanna be mindful of time because um, we're due for a break, but I wanna give the opportunity to maybe get one more question if anyone else has a question for Christine. Yep, yeah, um, Gothry. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, thanks, Christine. Um, appreciate your uh, your overview and analysis here. Um, kind of quickly, just related to to tribes and tribal consultation and and those kinds of things. One, I'm I'm sort of wondering um, if if the state of Colorado has come up with a directive for um, the the working group that that for the federally recognized tribes working group. Um, if they have a recommendation on what what their task is to to accomplish, um, hearing from the last presenter talking about the missteps of of not doing tribal consultation on the front end, um, wondering what like the the ramifications are looking like in a place like Colorado that's formalized uh, that process after the fact, um, and then recognizing the fact that you know us as a group aren't a state agency. Um, you know, what's what's one recommendation that you have for us as a group uh, to, you know, engage either with tribal leaders or tribal communities uh, across the state, um, either within education uh, about this or, um, you know, in sort of a, a opinions gathering kind of phase? Thank you. Yeah. I, um, so. The the update of the legislation in Colorado happened because of citizen action. So tribal citizens and Colorado citizens, um, it didn't come from the tribal governments. And so um, the DORA is, you know, the agency is reaching out to the tribes and encouraging representation on the working group and having those conversations. So um, they are trying to um, you know, course correct or not make those mistakes uh, that we heard Ariel talking about. Um, here in Minnesota, I, what I think, um, I, I guess, um, because, you know, Donovan has, has said that Red Lake is, is interested in looking at these, these medicines uh, to battle addiction, particularly opioid addiction. Um, <clears throat> I, I would suggest, yeah, that there be, there, there be a, a greater conversation around that. And I think 
there should be probably some more education for uh, all the tribes in Minnesota to ha you know happen uh, around both perspectives on on these medicines. You know, kind of like the, the lit review, the, you know, the Western academic clinical lit review from the science that says yes, you know, a lot of these medicines can treat mental health, can battle addiction, can you know do all these great things. But then also making sure that for if we're talking to tribes and educating tribes that we're also talking about the culture and, and um, our traditional ways of, of thinking about this and, and interacting with these, these medicine beings um, that that's critical, right? And that's, and I think that's where we can close the gap um, and make sure that, that tribes aren't just um, entering into another colonial system, but have an opportunity to actually create a framework that is culturally relevant and meaningful and respectful and, you know, um, upholding the, the rights of nature and, and conservation and all that. And, and also while helping their people, um, that's a, I hesitated to say it cause I'm like, well, that's a tall order. I don't know. I, I am open to having continuing conversations. Uh, you all can reach out to me. That's for sure. Thank you. So I do want to be mindful of time. Um, I do want to ask, um, or maybe we'll just uh, sign off there with you, Christine. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. And um, you know, if you're open for us reaching out with some follow-up, um, is, is that okay with you if, if we reach out and follow up with you? Certainly. Awesome. Thank you uh, so much. All right. So to, to the members, we no longer have a quorum because several people have left. So we're not going to be making any official decisions from this point on. We are due for a break, but if folks want to just get through our last bit of agenda items without a break and end early, um, if everyone could sort of maybe use the raise hand feature, if you would prefer to just go on um, and close out early. Who wants to do that? people and I guess yeah if folks or just really have to pee and say go ahead <laughs> um but it sounds like the majority of you just want to uh get through um but don't don't neglect your physical body if you really need to take a break um okay so it seems like folks I'm not sure if I'm counting this right okay a good chunk <laughs> okay so we'll go through. We um, so now we're going to move on to um, the working group update. So we have legal, regulatory, and policy. Um, so we have been working, kind of meeting once a month outside of this main task force meeting uh, to discuss specifically, you know, issues related to which legal pathways are we exploring, um, and um, policies and regulation and. They're all kind of intertwined from my understanding. And so um, I think first we'll start off, Paul is gonna give a really brief overview of kind of what the legal work group came up with. I know Bennett was supposed to give us an update on regulatory and I was gonna do policy. Um, I can kind of blend those both together because they're really kind of intertangled. Um, so Paula, do you wanna go ahead and give us a brief update from the legal working group? Sure. Uh, we spent the bulk of our conference I'm sorry, I'm in the room with, with Nick. Is the feedback okay? Are you guys getting feedback there? Or can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, we spent the bulk of our conversation at our last month's meeting uh, talking about the definition of, of medicine. And it was a very you know lively conversation, but uh, there was some thinking that, well, is medicine really more of a, a medical clinical model? And you, therefore, we should be looking at it within the framework of, of a medical Western clinical model. And then there was a lot of input about, no, medicine is a much topic and I think certainly just hearing our last presenter talk about uh, how medicine is used in, in indigenous uh, communities and, and with the respect to sacred culture and, and that we kind of move beyond that so I don't think that's really even a conversation that we need to have I think after some group discussion we kind of all landed with yeah medicine is a much broader subject it's not just clinical me medical western model um, definition so I think we're beyond that uh, there was a, a, a brief um, a uh, bit of information that came through from Ari. Uh, she had met with a, a representative, uh, Tamar Todd, if I'm saying that properly, who was a, a former legal director for the Drug Policy Alliance, uh, who, who shared some helpful information. And I know Ari put that on mural, so I'll be very brief, but it kind of mirrors the information that we got from Dr. Mason Marks around 
um, you know, we get too complicated. Uh, we we start to move into the world of of medical care. Um, uh, we're more likely to maybe run into some federal um, involvement, but that generally the position is the feds are not on the cusp of a crackdown. Um, that they're um, more likely to respond similar to how they responded to cannabis. Um, the main thing is that we're being that we're responsible, uh, thorough, uh, robust in what we do do. Um, that there's going to be a greater risk of federal involvement if we try to get the DEA uh, providers involved, providers with DEA registrations or licenses in the process. Uh, we don't want to make we want to make sure groups don't make medical claims that aren't federally um, uh, they don't meet federal approval uh, for the, those medical uses. Uh, we want to be careful that what happens doesn't involve harm, that meds aren't being diverted, very uh, low likelihood of a DEA waiver, and basically don't ask the feds for their opinion. They don't want to be on the record. So that was some of the medical, or excuse me, the legal advice that came from uh, Tamar Todd via REL. That's it. Thank you, Paula. Courtney, you have your hand up. Is that a remnant from us deciding? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that breakdown. Um, so for the policy and regulations, um, I'm just going to read a definition because I was trying, I was struggling to figure out like what is the actual definition of legal regulatory and policy and how can the work groups kind of intersect in that and I consulted with our last speaker Mason Marks around this because it seemed like a very basic concept and he's like this is going to be in any you know elementary legal textbook um, which I don't actually have a copy of so um, he said it's uh, pretty simple policy is just a goal and or a means of achieving it. So Minnesota lawmakers wish to, as an example, Minnesota lawmakers wish to reduce opioid overdose deaths or Minnesota lawmakers wish to achieve it by creating safe consumption sites. So that's one example of policy. So then he says legislation is an act of lawmaking through which policy is implemented or achieved. It often calls for regulation rules made by administrative agencies. And then regulation implements laws and it consists of administrative rule agencies can also develop their own policies. So I think that's kind of like the high level, simple description of this. So just thinking about all of that, I don't know if anyone had time to review. Um, I put a table together. It's in our working group mural, which is really trying to outline um, on the top of the table. I don't think we have this up in mural right now, but folks were sent a copy of it. Um, I don't know if that if that's open on your computer, Jess, if you can show that table or not, um, if we're only looking at mural. Um, I don't know if I'm able to share my screen. Is that possible? Uh, I can stop sharing and you can share, but I can get that open. I'm opening it right now. Okay. Um, so basically, I think we're all kind of struggling with, there's so many different intersecting things of the legal pathways we are charged with researching and understanding and then figuring out what kinds of policies yeah, and regulations can go on that. So the very top is really just what are the legal pathways that the legislation has charged us with, which is the you know administrative exemption, seeking judicially created exemption, petitioning um, the government for a research program, expanded access program, and right to try. So those were explicitly mentioned as things that we need to explore in the legislation. But as we've heard from other um, experts in different states, um, thinking about other ways that we could do this that actually would make us less in conflict with the federal government, um, which is also one of our charges is can we come up with ways to resolve conflicts should they arise in the different um, policies and regulations that we come up with. And the ones that seem to keep us the most out of conflict would be adult regulated use or decriminalization or a combination of both. So that's kind of the top of that table. And then kind of looking at each row is then kind of one, is it legal or not kind of at a federal level? If not, what can we do as a workaround? Um, if you can scroll down to the next page and then really trying to figure out um, how can we implement these things? And so that would get more to what, what policies and regulations would we start to consider um, to do this? And then as our um, policy work group met, we kind of came up with some other options around like what things can we consider, consider under each of these um, so if you want to keep scrolling down farther, I don't want to go into all the details of this just because I want to let folks end early. This is really like bigger than us just doing an update right now, but thinking about what, uh, so scroll down more one more page, thinking around like, okay, what are equity issues um, that are going to be considered? What are the policy consultations we need to do with tribes? What are we going to do about drug supply? Um, so I think all of this can be filled out. And for those that are, you know, in the working groups, I really encourage you to, 
add to this um, based on your information. Um, this is definitely a work in progress. It's just really my attempt to try and put all of it in one place so we can start to figure out how to fill in the gaps here so that we can start to develop our recommendations or research and recommendations around all of these different options. Um, so that's just a starting point. And then I think this will hopefully feed nicely into that um, flow chart that Nick put together uh, to try and kind of figure out how we can actually move through the process and make decisions. And so hopefully at some point, um, we'll be able to really start to make decisions and vote on what pathways we really want to start uh, focusing on. Um, and so this gets back to this, what Jess has on the screen here is the who, what, where, when, and why. And so it would be nice if task force members could, could get on the mural, the main mural, and just kind of think about um, from your perspective, you know, and you can use the little sticky notes at the bottom, what, what do you see in terms of this being implemented? So who should have access what are the contexts or um, let's see, what does it say? What forms of access, where, where, what are the facilities that people can do this? When will people to have access and why are people wanting to, to have access? So just kind of thinking more broadly, but also if you have other kind of interpretations of who, what, when, where, and why, this is just my very quick um, uh, interpretations of, of what these things might mean, but I'm just one person. Uh, so I do encourage everyone to really provide your input and feedback so we can get more done with the working group meetings and really um, uh, flesh this out because it's complicated. <laughs> so yeah. So does anyone have any thoughts or comments about this or questions? I know I kind of threw a lot out. The table you made was really helpful. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Yep, Paula. You know, just getting back to our original charge, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps I'm missing something, but you know, if we're charged with the, you know, understanding the legal, medical, and policy implication associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine, medicine isn't isn't there an assumption in our charge that we we are legalizing and that we're supposed to look at it from these angles? From my understanding, it's like, yeah, creating a legalized system. But I think, so we do have, from my understanding, states' rights, so we can create our own program here as long as it's sort of contained within the state and doesn't conflict with any, if it is something that's not federally legal, then we need to figure out if it's something we're trying to explore that impacts federal jurisdiction, how are we going to navigate that? The way to avoid that is to keep it all completely what, what are people calling closed loop. And then we can essentially, from my understanding, do what we want as long as the state agrees that that's the best path for Minnesota. But, you know, whether that impacts like veterans that are trying to engage with the VA, that's a federal healthcare system. So that might look different or people that have federal jobs in the state. So I think it's not as simple as that. Um, I don't know what that looks like with cannabis, like medical cannabis. And I know people have had issues of like, they can't have medical cannabis if they have a federal job, even though it's legal in the state. So those kinds of things I think we need to figure out. Which I totally appreciate that, but it's pretty safe to assume that we are operating from those aspects of legalization. That legalization is a given. Yeah. Okay. So we're not, we're not debating that anymore. I think it's what's what's the legal framework? Is it a medical legal program? Is it adult regulated use legal program? Is it decriminalization? I think that that aspect of it matters and that will determine what policies and regulations can allow that to happen. All right, thank you. Thank you. And I do want to point out, so Utah, I don't know if anyone saw this, it's not really making any news, um, but on Friday, Utah legislature unanimously passed a psychedelic medicine bill um, to basically allow any psychedelic that's in a phase three clinical trial to be used within their healthcare system. But it didn't speak about funding or sourcing of the drugs. So from my understanding, according to the table that I created, that's really what we would call the expanded access program, which is asking the drug supplier to give you the drug under a specific expanded access clinical trial, which is already federally legal. It just requires a lot of negotiation with the pharmaceutical company. Um, but that that has happened. And so there's an update there on that. Um, so that's kind of an interesting development. But are there any other pressing questions? I know we promised we'd end early. We're at 1220. Those are any other comments, questions, thoughts? 
I, I, this is Jess. I do want to jump in uh, and just remind folks to respond to your survey uh, mm -hmm. that you sent out um, about defining psychedelic medicine. If you have, uh, if you have, can't, if you have trouble accessing, you should reach out to the chair directly. Um, we do have work group meetings coming up. Uh, the legal work group is meeting Thursday. Regulatory meets on Monday, one week from today, and then the policy work group um, is scheduled to meet on Tuesday, March 19th. You sh everybody who's, who was on the original meeting invite should have received a new meeting series from me. You can go ahead and delete the one from Chrissy. Um, she did, I assume she didn't have time to cancel those before she was done. Yeah, and let me, let me make sure that's all I had to say. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the reminder. I think most people on this call have replied. I don't necessarily want to call folks out, but I think I do see a few people that haven't taken it. We've had 15 people respond, 16 including myself. So just a few more people. I think 22 is our total membership. So that's actually a pretty good response. It would just be nice to get some engagement from other. Most of the people that didn't respond or have, have left the meeting or didn't attend um, today. Um, so I can also do a follow-up email, but I appreciate all of your responses to that survey just so we can kind of get a sense of where everyone's at with psychedelic medicine. Just this is Stacy. If this is a good time, I'd like to also encourage everybody to give us some feedback on our meeting processes. Um, I will grab your attention. You know, the sailboat uh, um, tool that we use for feedback this time around we would very much appreciate if you focus your feedback on what we call below the waterline questions. So the two questions at the bottom of the screen, we really wanna hear what from your perspective are the anchors that are holding this group back? Are the things that are dragging us back, slowing us down, whatever it might be. <coughs> could be information, could be something else. And then also looking at what barriers you see as you look ahead. So focus on both of those areas for feedback. We really want you to get into the, uh, the underwater, what's holding us back stuff here. Uh, and so I'll turn it back to you, Jessica, if you wanna wrap up the rest of the meeting. Yeah, thanks, Stacy. Thanks for that reminder. Mm -hmm. I just wanna say thank you all to the participants for attending and sticking it out till the end. I really appreciate your engagement. I feel like this was one of the more engaging meetings with a lot of input from members. I really appreciate all your insightful questions to our subject matter experts and to Caroline. Um, and also thanks to anyone that's watching live on YouTube. Thanks for your attention. And with that, we'll close out and we'll see all of you either at the working group meetings or at the next meeting in April. Hey, everyone.